Harry Potter, Dimensional Wizard. Chapter 91, Foundation of Civilization. After Amelia came into office, with complete control of the entire ministry, she can pass any laws that she wanted. And her first goal was to get rid of many of the old laws and regulations, however, she also knew that she could not rush such a thing. So, she approached the entire situation with care and decided to take things slow. After all, technically speaking, she held the position until she decided to retire, or someone gave valid reasons for her retirement. Just like, it was already Christmas break of 1992. And Edward did not do much research during most of the semester as he was studying genetic to prepare for his next magical study. The only thing he accomplished was studying the basilisks and managing to create one of his own. Even the werewolf potions were created by Snape and Damocles Belby who was the inventor of the wolfsbane potion. On the first day after the break, Edward received a letter from someone. With elated breath, he used the flip powder to arrive at his destination. In front of a French fireplace, Edward saw a beautiful young woman smiling and waiting for her. At first, he was surprised and almost instinctively wanted to flirt with her, then he remembered who she was. I have to say, Miss Perinelle, you are even more beautiful than I imagined, said Edward with his usual charming voice. Thank you for the compliment. It's unfortunate that not only am I taken, but also a few hundred years too old for you, replied Mrs. Flamel. It's a shame indeed. Then Edward turned his head to see a handsome middle-aged French man also waiting for him. Now I understand how you were able to marry such a beautiful wife, it seems that you were also a handsome lad in your youth, Mr. Flamel. Call me, Nicholas Fel.C. Edward could see that the grand alchemist was not used to his newfound youth. Most likely, if it was not that his wife was so young, he would have preferred to choose an older look similar to Dumbledore. After engaging in small and casual talk for a few minutes, the group finally entered a laboratory. There, Nicholas showed Edward a great stone. Without hesitation, he started analyzing it. You did it so quickly. A philosopher's stone made with emotions instead of souls, said Edward, unable to contain the joy in his voice. Well, you already gave the general blueprint, so it was not that easy. There is no need to be humble. This invention will forever change wizarding civilization, and you will be credited for it. Nicholas Flamel's old eyes burned with a vivid flame, before returning to calm, then, he smiled. So, is there anything to report? Well, as you theorized, this stone cannot create the elixir of immortality. However, it can still be used to prolong life, but nothing compared to the real stone. Edward nodded, then said, let's call the one made of emotion the lesser stone. All right. Additionally, I always felt that the lesser stone was completely different from greater stone. It's understandable, replied Edward. Previously, I believed that the greater stone was just really condensed magic powers being by souls. But I was not completely correct. The soul and the magic power are combined to form an unknown change. Most likely, we have not come even close to understand the abilities of that stone. As for the lesser stone, emotions are only a small part of the soul, so it must lacking abilities. However, it does not matter as its powers are more than enough. Edward paused slightly as he observed the green stone. With it, we can ignore Gamp's law of elemental transfiguration and make food out of nothing. As such, no wizard or muggle will ever suffer from hunger on this planet. Based on the elixir of immortality, we can cure most if not all maladies on this planet. We can create any metals both magical and non-magical through transmutation. Using this stone as a medium, it is possible to integrate both magic and technology together, driving our civilization forward into both an interstellar and interdimensional era. On top of that, the stone is a clean and renewable resource. As long as magical powers still exist in the ley line nodes and humans have emotions, they can be manufactured in large quantities. The greater stone is considered a perfect material, so it can last forever on its own. As for the lesser stone, it should be able to last a few centuries. This small stone is the foundation of any powerful civilization. The Flamels marveled at Edward's words. Although they knew that he had great ambitions and would accomplish them someday, they did not think that someday would be so soon. And, more importantly, that they would play such a great role in the process. Nicholas sighed deeply as he was glad that he accepted Edward's invitation. The only downside was that he wished his old friend, Albus, would see things his way and changed his mind. M. After everybody calmed down, Edward asked, was there any side effect to the people who had their emotions absorbed during the process? No, replied Nicholas. As long as not too much was absorbed, they were perfectly fine. Furthermore, we did not just use the emotions of one person, but many at the same time. Nodding his head, Edward continued asking, what about the control group that used only dark emotions to make the stone? Perinel then showed him a dark green stone before explaining, so, far beside the change in color, and an increase in power when using dark magic when using the stone, there was not much difference. Can you show me the data? No, problem, she answered before giving him a piece of paper with a comparison of the two stones. Edward nodded after reviewing them. Just like when he first tested the stone after creating the first one, the dark green one could augment any dark magic compared to the normal one. Following this, Edward did a few basic tests with the stone to make sure that everything was all right, 
then he gave the flamels their next assignment that they could help him with. Nicholas took a document from Edward's hand, opened it, and read the title, Project Magician. Although surprised by the silly title, he kept on going. However, the more he read, the more shocked he became. Edward, are you serious? What is it dear? asked Perinel who took the document and quickly read through it. You actually want to find a way for muggles to use magic? It should be possible, said Edward calmly. Theoretically, as long as we find a way for muggles to create an artificial magic core, then it's true, said Nicholas. But, you should know that things would not be so simple. I do not need for all muggles to be able to use magic. However, even if it's only 10% of them, with a population of 7 billion, that's still more than all the current wizard population on this planet. If I want to create a magical civilization, the population will be an issue. And if I have to wait for the natural way for more wizards to be born, it will take me too long, and I do not want to wait. So, this is the best approach. The flamel couple looked at one another and nodded, we will do our best. You can contact me if you have any issues. Then, Edward bid them goodbye as he returned home. He first sent little Susan a letter telling her that he will have to cancel on his promise, but he will make it up to her later, then he entered his laboratory for his experiment. Underscore 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 underscore. Chapter 92 Cogredil After dealing with the flamel's couple issues, Edward started his research. He placed his crown on his head to increase his intelligence, then officially begin. He first entered a room full of eggs of different sizes and shapes, these were dragon eggs. Today, his goal was to create a real dragon, just like he said to the Gryffindor trio in Hagrid's hut. To achieve this goal, Edward did not start directly with trying to purify the dragon's bloodline, but instead, focused on the body aspect of the life code. One thing that Edward noticed recently was that he had overlooked the importance of that aspect on the life code. Whether it was the soul, bloodline, or body, DNA, they were all connected one way or another. So, Edward spent the past few months studying genetic, and he had a few accomplishments. For once, he discovered a magic gene which was the connection between the bloodline and body aspect of the life code. And, according to my research, J.K. Rowling admitted that there is a magic gene. Those born with the gene active were wizards and witches, and those without it are muggles and squibs. After this discovery, his understanding of the life code once again increased. So, he begins his experiment with this. Using a combination of alchemy items and the scientific method, he edited the gene of many dragons to induce biological atavism on these magical beasts, hoping to return to their ancestral form. After doing this, he teleported these eggs into a special room designed with the exact environment needed for them to hatch. Tubes were inserted inside them. Then, the eggs disappeared for a split moment before returning. Immediately afterward, they started to hatch. Some of them did not break their shell, some of them died immediately afterward, while the surviving ones started to grow at an abnormal rate. In just a few seconds, the surviving dragons grew to adult size. The reason for that was because Edward did not want to waste time on this experiment, so he used the power of the gate. By sending these eggs to five years in the past and bringing them back to the present, they rapidly age by that amount. He then used the tubes attached to their bodies to provide them with the necessary nutrients for their growth. After checking the surviving dragons, Edward quickly how they were different from normal dragons in this universe. For once, they had four legs and wings unlike the normal dragons in this universe that only has two legs, and their wings are their fourth limbs. Following this, Edward did a quick check on this new breed of dragons and summarized the difference between them. For once, they are way more intelligent than ordinary dragons. If ordinary dragons had the intelligence of 5 to 8 years old, these were 8 to 12. Additionally, their scales were more magic resistant, they were 54 to 83 percent larger, and the amount of magic power in their bodies far exceed the usual standard. Their bloodline mutated and became even more powerful as a result of this experiment. Unfortunately, this was not the result that Edward was looking for. Nevertheless, this was just the first step in his experiment. After that, he repeated the first step once again, thus creating more of this new breed of dragons. With the result of the first trial, the success rate became higher and the process faster and easier. And with each success, his understanding. Afterward, Edward had those new dragons breed with one another. With the power of the world gate, the female dragon's pregnancy was instant, and the growth of these baby dragons was also instant. Of course, there were a few casualties during the process. After all, the power of time is not easily messed with. After that, he had these new dragons inbred to keep their bloodline pure. With the power of time, he only spent a day to bred these creatures for countless generations, until a dragon with the purest bloodline was born. Unfortunately for him, due to the generation of inbreeding, he was a little crazy and infertile after being born. Edward had experience dealing with craziness due to bloodline because of Bellatrix, so he could fix that problem, but he could not do anything about infertility. But, he did not care about that as his plan was going alright. We knew e .co. Edward walked into a room with a basin full of blood. Many ancient runes were engraved all over the basin, and a philosopher's stone was in the middle, connecting all these enchantments. 
This pool of blood was the bloodline of all the new dragons for countless generations. After they gave birth to the next generation, Edward would draw their bloodline from their bodies and stored it here. As for the enchantments, it was to purify the blood, these enchantments were based on the principle of purifying metals in alchemy but designed for bloodlines. The essence of them was basically, the philosopher's stone will use its massive and pure energy to destroy anything that is deemed weak or unnecessary in this blood, leaving only the best genetic material. After activating them, the blood in the pool lit up, then slowly started to reduce inside. Three days later, a glowing red sphere was floating on top of the philosopher's stone, it looked both like a solid and a liquid. After spending analyzing the red liquid and recording the information about it, Edward fed it to the only remaining dragon with the purest of bloodlines. Immediately afterward, a cocoon enveloped its body, turning it into a giant egg. Edward spent the next few hours with elation as he slowly felt the life growing inside the giant egg. But something occurred the following day. A weird mental wave emitted from the egg. After using his mind to feel it, he received a message, I need energy. Already had the mental capacity to communicate, muttered Edward with a satisfied smile. So, he placed the giant egg in the middle of a ley line node and watched as it absorbed the magical power inside to grow. A few days later, the egg was larger and taller than the basilisk by a few times. Cracks started to appear from it, and soon, beautiful and majestic creatures with two horns and wide wingspan appeared. The creature roared in the sky as it said, My name Cogredil, the Thunder Dragon King, and the last of my kind. Oddly though, he was speaking in a strange language, but anyone who heard him would instantly understand his meaning. After saying this, a special signal emanated from his body. This signal was not even detected by any of Edward's instruments, let alone him. It bypassed all the enchantments in his laboratory on the moon and spread throughout the entire universe. No one on earth noticed that signal except for death. In the dimension of the afterlife, death looked at the moon as he muttered, a real dragon? What exactly is that wizard doing in there? Meanwhile, after Cogredil declared his existence, he looked down at Edward and said, human, thank you for all your help in bringing the dragon race back to this world. Before L left, I can grant you any wishes that are within my ability. With a calm look on his face, Edward said, enough with your nonsense, Neil. Immediately, a powerful force deep in Cogredil's soul and bloodline acted and forced him to bow his head, and lay on the ground. If you can become smaller, do so, ordered Edward. Then, the Dragon King did so, reducing his size to that of a normal Hungarian horntail. That's better, said Edward in satisfaction. Human, what have you done to me, roared Cogredil. I have spent so much energy creating you, do you think it was for nothing? During the entire process, I have placed so many restrictions in your soul and bloodline for countless generations. So, you belong to me. Chapter 93, Bloodline Inheritance After getting Cogredil under control, Edward then asked, So, what ability do you have that differentiates you from other dragons? The Dragon King scoffed at him and did not answer. However, Edward did not mind as he said, You can either cooperate with me, or I force you to do, your choice. After a brief pause, the dragon opened his mouth and used a dragon breath attack. However, what came of his mouth was not fire, but condensed thunder. Well, that's new, said Edward. No wonder you called yourself the Thunder Dragon King. Do not insult me, human wizard. I'm a dragon king because of how noble my bloodline is. So, the dragon race is hierarchical one based on the purity of bloodline? Cogredil did not answer him, and Edward did not mind. He then did a full body check on this dragon, and he discovered that he broke through the second limiter, thus had a magic power 75 times that of an ordinary wizard. How fascinating, said Edward. Your magic power is concentrated in all the parts of your body, all your muscles, bones, and scale. Although I've seen this phenomenon in magical beasts like basilisks and phoenix, nothing compares to you. Can these beasts you mentioned be compared to me, said Cogredil. And what do you mean by magic power? Are you talking about mana? Mana? Was that the name of magic power in ancient times? Edward was used to the name mana as it is usually associated with magic in his past life. But now, the term showed up in the Harry Potter universe. And, from now on, magic power will be addressed as mana. That's correct, replied the proud dragon. Edward nodded before continuing, if my theory is correct, you should have a bloodline inheritance, now, let me take a look at it. He placed the diadem on his head, placed his head on the dragon's head, and activated the bloodline contract that he placed on its ancestors. Soon afterward, a large amount of information entered his head. Using the diadem, he processed it extremely quickly. Dragon chant magic, muttered Edward, then he waved his hand said, incendio. A small jet of fire appeared in his left hand. Then, he said, defe. A small fireball appeared in his right hand. Interesting, using the same amount of mana, a charm using the dragon language is three to five times stronger than a regular one. However, what is the reason? Aguamenti. DLO. Edward then conjured two different sizes of clean, drinkable water. I see. Incantations are used to mobilize the mana inside a wizard's magic core. Hence, once a wizard can freely control his mana, he can use silent casting. 
However, the dragon language seems to be able to mobilize mana at a higher frequency, making each spell more powerful and efficient. Not to mention that the complex nature of the language makes it more suitable for magic. Additionally, this type of magic makes it easier to use charms that require emotions or imagination. However, logically speaking, the devil language that I used in my contract should also have some magical powers that I'm not aware of, especially when it comes to soul-related magic. I should look more into it. Now, there is the concept that magic operates at a different frequency. I noticed this phenomenon when studying house elves. Since their magic operates at a different frequency, it made that most anti-apparition enchantments useless to them, hence the reason that they can apparate in Hogwarts. I never place too much emphasis on that, but now, it seems that I should study this more thoroughly. Edward knew that his understanding of magic will dramatically increase after thoroughly studying dragon chant magic, but now was not the time for this, he still had another purpose for creating the dragon. Meanwhile, Cogredil was internally greatly surprised at how quickly Edward was able to use dragon magic, and how quickly he figured out its essence. In his memories, many humans have had the opportunity to study dragon magic, but few could do so, let alone master it or figure it its essence. After using a tremendous amount of willpower to stop his research, Edward decided to accomplish his original goal. He placed his hand on Cogredil's body and he said, Fusion. Suddenly, the dragon was absorbed into Edward's body. Soon, afterward, Edward grew to more than 10 meters, golden scales appeared all over his body, his fingers turned into claws, and two pairs of wings grew from his back. A large mirror appeared in front of him and he looked at his new body. Half dragon? Dragon blood warrior? Well, it does not matter. Let's see if my theory is correct. After checking his body, he muttered with elation, I was right. The second limiter is removed. However, he paused for a moment, before entering his soul space. There, he saw a giant dragon looking down on him. Now, you will pay for your insolence, human wizard, said the soul of the dragon king, before launching towards Edward. The latter, however, just gave him a random look before a gigantic cage appeared and imprisoned the dragon. Impossible. How can your soul be so powerful? Ignoring him, Edward regained consciousness, and he finished testing his new body and abilities. The advantage of dragon and human. Wait, the magic veins of this form are perfect for humans. By studying it and replicating it, it could not increase the power of the human wizard, but also allow them to use magic without a wand more easily. Dream on, said Cogredal directly through the soul. How can regular human wizards support to have such a detailed and complex magic vein? Without the proper amount of mana, it would be impossible. True, but I can still create a less complex version. And as wizards grow and become more powerful, they can further modify their veins until they reach this level. After doing all kinds of tests on the dragon, Edward separated from him and returned to his normal body. He first checked his magic core and his second limiter was still open. However, he did not have the complex magic veins that he had on while in dragon warrior mode. However, it did not matter. Now that he knew the pathways of the magical veins, he could modify his body to be just like that, and his mana was enough for the operation. Speaking of mana, now that he broke his second limiter, he now had another method, superior bloodline body fusion, and it was higher than even his body modification. With enough potion, he can soon reach the same amount of mana as Cogredal. Then, all he has to do is use the Philosopher's Stone to break the last limiter. After doing all his tests, Edward looked at the Thunder Dragon King and said, I'm curious, logically speaking, I should be able to access all your memories and understanding of magic through the bloodline inheritance, but all I got was the dragon language and how to use it. Humph, you overestimated yourself. Throughout the history of our dragon clan, many people wanted to acquire our magic, but they all failed. You should be proud to be even able to acquire our language. I see, so your ancestor placed safety to prevent other races to acquire your inheritance. Interesting, I'll have to study this at a later time. Now, let's talk about what to call you. My name is Cogredil, roared the dragon. I know, but from now on, I will call you. Chapter 94, The Power of Love. A few days later, Edward checked his magic core that was filled with mana. After breaking the third limiter and reached the ceiling of mana in this world, he was thinking about the way forward, not for him, but other wizards. His current plan was to follow examples from wuxia novels and try to compress his mana until it's liquefied. However, despite his superb control over his mana, he could not do so. Thus, he figured out that another method was needed to succeed. Nevertheless, he was not in a hurry. He figured that if everything went to plan after a wizard managed to liquefy his mana, he would go through a magical and mysterious transformation with many benefits like an increase in soul power, and an even longer lifespan. And if this method works, then wizards will have to one day further compress their mana into solid form which is similar to the philosopher's stone. So, if he succeeds in replacing the stone with his magic core, he will skip the middle process directly to the end. According to his calculation, Edward can now live for 1000 years with the amount of mana that he has in his body after opening the third limiter. And he was not surprised by that number. An ordinary wizard that has not broken through the first limiter can live up to 200 years, and some talented one lives for longer. 
An example of this is the headmaster, before Dumbledore, Armando Dippet, who is currently 355 years old. Edward checked on him and discovered that the old man broke his first limiter in his old age, thus increasing his mana and lifespan. Another example of longevity among wizards is Barry Winkle, who is currently 756 years old even older than the flamel. Edward once thought that this guy made his own philosopher's stone so he visited him. Only did he learn that this guy invented a kind of magic that allows him to make sacrifices to some unknown beings, and in return, he will be granted longer lifespans. The sacrifices can be anything from gold to books, to human lives. After learning this, Edward hurriedly erased this guy's memory about this magic. Edward learned the hard way not to mess with strange dimensional beings of unknown origin. During his days as a thief, he messed around with dimensions after acquiring the book, Key of Solomon, that allowed him to summon demons from another dimension. In one of his experiments, he tried to reverse the summoning process and use his world gate to enter another dimension, and in the process, he encountered a powerful being and almost died. Back to the present, inside one room, after his men reached the full level of 100 times that of a normal wizard, Edward looked at all the potions battles on the floor and he was glad that he did not have to drink these nasties potions again. While cleaning up, Edward started thinking about whether there was a better way to increase mana than the potion that just accelerate the rate that a person's mana naturally grew. He tried to make a mana increase potion, but he failed even when he used the liquid mana inside a leyline node. That potion did increase the amount of mana in his core, but only temporarily, it acted more like a mana buff in games. After placing this potion on his list of things to research, Edward left. He first contacted someone before taking a shower and operating somewhere. Soon, afterward, Edward was in the laboratory with a bunch of excited scientists, and Snape who was trying very hard to control his emotions. Edward first looked at the sleeping body of Lily Potter, or to be precise, her clones. He first removed the new soul that was just born. Then, he took out the resurrection stone to call out her real stone. Soon afterward, a pale and translucent Lily appeared in the room, however, she seems to be sleeping. Edward then started to check if there was any problem with her soul. Meanwhile, in the room next door, a bunch of scientists was analyzing a bunch of data. Hurry up people, this is our opportunity to discover the secrets of the soul. What the reading saying, said one person that seemed in charge in his lab. Sir, we cannot see anything. Whether it's thermal vision, night vision, radar, etc. We cannot see anything. However, we have discovered a strange electromagnetic wave in the room. The chief scientist nodded, then he said, put the goggles on. All the researchers then placed a goggle on. Finally, they were able to see Lily's soul in front of Edward and Snape. They were fascinated. Meanwhile, after checking Lily's soul, he placed it on her body. A few minutes later, her eyelash trembled and she opened her eyes. Where am I, muttered Lily as she looked around. Severus? Shouldn't I be dead? With trembling hands, Snape said, you were, but now you're back to the world of the living. Resurrection? Did you use some dark magic to revive me? Asked Lily, a little agitated. With a frown on his face, Edward used a spell to calm her, then let Snape explain the entire situation to her. So, it has been twelve years? Harry is all grown up now. She then looked at Edward and said, thank you, for resurrecting me. Although Lily wanted to ask about her husband, she knew that this probably was not the best time. Oh. As for Edward, he just nodded to her, then a look of surprise appeared on his face. What's wrong? Asked Snape. Her soul is slowly changing her body, recreating her original bloodline. Her magic core is also slowly reforming. This is truly fascinating, replied Edward, as he recorded the entire process. This kind of data was extremely precious for, Project Magician. Suddenly, he noticed something odd again. What's wrong now? Asked Snape after seeing Edward's change of expression. A strange magic is slowly being formed inside her soul. Where I have seen this thing before. Yes, the ancient magic of love, replied Edward. I thought you said that wizards cannot use ancient magic like love? That's what I thought too. But it appeared that it's possible, but the requirements may be extremely harsh. Requirement? Most likely, after she resurrected, her soul transformed and she brought with her the magic of love from the afterlife. Immediately afterward, Edward gave Lily a wand and asked her to try to use it. Luckily for him, she did not suffer from amnesia. Lily closed her eyes, then waved her wand. A purple light came from it and entered Edward's body. Soon, he found that his strength, stamina, agility, and even mana slightly increased by 5%. He could also feel that this increase was temporary, more like a buff. And he could tell that the reason that the increase was so little was due to how strong he already was and because Lily was not adept at controlling this magic. Edward nodded before asking, do you have any other abilities? After pondering for a brief moment, she answered, I feel like I can do many more things, but I'm not sure. However, I know that I can use an ability called, Absolute Shield. With it, I erect a shield around people to protect them against any attack. Any attack? Yes, any attack of any strength. Edward frowned as he asked, there should be some limits to this ability right? Lily hesitated a while before saying, yes. There is a duration limit, more importantly, Harry has to be next to me. 
Edward nodded, before conducting a few tests to make sure that she was perfectly fine. Then, he said, there are two things, first, now that you have control of the magic of love, there is something you can help me. Second, for the time being, you cannot have contact with other people even Harry. You can see him from afar, or disguise as someone else to see him, but do not reveal your identity. Why? Severus will explain the reason for you. After that, Edward left as he has two other people to revive. Scene break. Edward walked into his aunt's house. She and Susan were having dinner. However, after seeing him, she ignored him. With a wry smile, Edward said, I know that I broke my promise to bring you in a vacation around the world, but I have a gift to make it to you. Soon, two people came from behind him. Susan squinted her eyes as she looked at them, then very precious memories of her came to her mind. As she could use Edward's mind palace charm, she also had an eidetic memory. One of the memory that she would constantly review in her spare time was that of two giants, holding a baby and playing with it, she knew that these giants were her parents. So, once these two people walked into the room, she recognized their faces. Tears started to fall from Susan's eyes, then, without any hesitation or fear, she ran into their embrace. Chapter 95 Magic Veins A month passed since Edward had a reunion with his aunt and uncle. Now, he was inside his manor on earth, doing a little test. In an instant, he disappeared and reappeared on the moon. After landing, he could breathe normally without a problem and was not affected by any form of radiation. However, Edward was not focused on that. After studying dragon chant magic with Albion for the past month, my understanding of the magic of this world has reached an unimaginable level. I can now apparate on my own from the earth to the moon. Although Albion Witch was the new name that he gave the dragon as he did not like the name Cogridal was difficult to get along with at first, he convinced him to cooperate with him with the promise of creating another real dragon for him to mate. Albion was quite furious after meeting the dragons of this age as he called them Low Bloodline Wyvern. Although he could control the dragon, having him cooperate on his own will make things easier. Then, he started flying around on the moon without encountering any problem. With my new understanding of magic, I can optimize the world gate to be able to travel more than 300 years back in the past and even go forward 300 years in the future. However, now is not a good time. I should do one final upgrade after studying those things. After that, there is a chance that I will be able to travel to another universe afterward. After doing a few tests, Edward returned to Earth. Scene break. Edward just finished the third year class, then he made an announcement to the students. He walked to a large cover in the corner of the class, the students have been dying to know what was under the cover since the beginning, but the professor told them to wait after class. Edward removed the large cloth, then what was underneath was revealed, it was a giant robot with a glowing red light in the middle of its chest. The muggle-born students recognized it as such, but the others did not. This in front of you is a golem, or as muggle called it, a robot, said Edward. I understand that some of you might not understand the concept of robot or eve golem, but let me explain in simple terms. I'm sure all of you have seen the walking armor in the school, or all the statues located through the castle. Well, all of them can move on their own and protect the school when necessary, so they are golem. The difference between them and the one in front of you is the fact that this one is made of metal and used something called mana crystal as an energy source, but the one in the castle used the magic from the castle itself to function. Professor, what's a mana crystal? Good question, but I cannot explain this to you guys like this kind of knowledge is too advanced for you. But in simple terms, mana crystal is a battery that can power some alchemy items, and more importantly, it can allow even muggles to use these items. The students were first surprised, then they nodded their heads to indicate that they understood. However, only a few of them understood the true implication of such an invention. Fl.c. Edward then continues, the purpose of this golem is to teach the class for the remaining of the semester. Because I will be occupied with something important, I cannot teach you guys. So, I created this golem to replace me. Immediately, Edward activated the golem. The red light in the middle of its chest light up, then the golem started to move. It looked at the students with its red eyes as he said, scanning. Identifying the third-year class. Reviewing curriculum, process completed. Classifying students based on their learning abilities, process completed. Hello, students, you can call me Professor Iron. You can ask me any question you have about class and I will answer you. All the students marveled for a while with their new professor, then one student asked, what if you do not know the answer to a question? I have all the memories and knowledge of Professor Bones, so it's unlikely that would be the case. However, in the unlikely case that you asked me something that I do not know, I'm programmed to contact Professor Bones and ask him about it. Following this, the students spent the remaining of class talking with Professor Iron. Meanwhile, after class ended, Edward was prepared to leave when Hermione stopped him. Professor, I have a quick question that I wanted to ask. What is Miss Granger? I recently met a house elf named Dobby, and I wanted to ask why is it so easy for him to use wandless magic compared to wizards? Is it because of the bloodline you once mentioned? No, the reason is because of magic veins. Magic veins? Yes. Wizard's anatomy is slightly different from muggles. 
We have another circulatory system in our body where magic power or mana flows throughout our body from the magic core. As a result of this flow, wizards have a longer lifespan, are more resistant to impact or magic attacks, healed quicker, etc. When a wizard cast a charm, the mana has to travel from the core to the hand. That process will take time and effort based on the magical veins of the wizard. So, Housel elves have better magic veins than us, asked Hermione. Well, not really. Compared to humans, house elves' magical veins are usually more simple. As a result of this, mana easily travels to their hands. However, as a result of this simplicity, they do not have other benefits like high magic resistance, long lifespan, etc. Additionally, the fact that human wizards cannot easily use wandless casting is more complex than suggested. For example, African wizards' magic veins are more developed than European wizards. The reason for that is because of the wand. The wand forcefully opens the magic veins from the core to the hand, making spells instant, and even amplify the power. However, as a result of relying on the wand for countless generations, European wizards have stopped relying on their magic veins, making them enter a state of atrophy. So, complex veins give wizard many benefits, but makes using wandless difficult, said Hermione. Correct. However, with practice, wizards can use wandless cast and instant casting, just like house elves. And according to my latest research, the more complex a magic vein is, the more powerful a wizard can be. Edward thought about the magic veins he had when in the dragon transformation form. He planned to modify his body to those veins. One last question, professor, said Hermione. Hypothetically speaking, if a muggle could create a magic core and have their own magic veins, could they use magic just like wizards? Edward paused for a moment after hearing this, he then looked at her and asked, what brought on this idea? I've had this idea for a while now. But after seeing the mana crystal you mentioned, and your explanation of the magic veins, I thought that it might be possible. Edward nodded, then he answered, hypothetically, it is possible, but there are other things to consider, like the soul and mind. Even if such a method was to be invented, not all muggles would have the qualification to use magic. But it is possible, asked Hermione with a twinkle in her eyes. Yes, it is, replied Edward. Then, Hermione left the classroom with a smile on her face. As for Edward, he looked in the corner where there was nothing, he then said, see, this is the difference between you and her. She does not only use magic but tries to innovate. She questions its limits and possibilities. No one answered him, but he heard the sound of footsteps walking away. Chapter 96 Mysteries After class, Edward walked to his room in the castle to prepare to leave. Midway through, he encountered Harry Potter, who seemed to be waiting for him. How can I help you, Mr. Potter? Professor. Well, my godfather Sirius wanted me to invite you to dinner to thank you for clearing his name and giving Wormtail, I mean Peter Pettigrew the punishment that he deserved. Edward frowned, then he said, I'm sorry, but I have to disappoint you. I'm currently very busy and have no time. It has reached the point that I will not even be teaching for the remainder of the semester. Is that so? Yes. But tell Sirius that when I have time, I will be glad to visit him. After patting Harry's shoulder, he entered his room. However, soon afterward, he received a communication from Snape through a cell phone. Edward first activated the enchantments in the room that prevented other people from snooping, then he answered the call. A holographic image of Severus Snape appeared in front of him. What is it? asked Edward. Sir, some of the Death Eaters brought to my attention a little problem. Many of them do not have the talent or patient for research, so they are asking if there were other ways that they can be useful? That is indeed a problem. Well, place them in the training program with the werewolves and vampires. Speaking of, how is their training going? I have been following the training regiment designed by the Muggle military officer, so they now a truly elite magical force. However, say it if there is a problem? No, they do not have any problem. It's just that my research, and the things going on with Lily, I feel like I do not have enough time. So, I would like for someone else to take my position. Hmm, do you have any suggestions? The Malfoys. The Malfoys? I remember that they were researching grafting magical organs on wizards and muggles. The research is mainly done by Narcissa. So, Lucius can take charge of training the army. Well, so be it. Is there anything else? No, sir. Okay, then. Scene break. Edward walking on the lowest level of the Ministry of Magic. Amelia was next to him, while a person with a hood on was behind them. How are things going? asked Edward. Quite great actually. The initiative to introduce muggle technology to British wizards is going rather well. All we have to do is buy them, then magically enchant them. Has there been any backlash internationally? Not as much as we expected. Your reputation is far greater than you expected. How about your magical capabilities? They are also going well. Recently, using the practice method you gave me, I broke the first limiter. It was easier than expected. Edward nodded as he was not too surprised by his aunt's talent. According to the original timeline, Amelia was one of the most powerful witches of this time. Before her death, she fought countless Death Eaters alone without being defeated. In the end, Voldemort himself had to take action to kill her, and it was implied that put on a good fight. 
What about your mana level? What's mana? Well, I recently learned that magic power used to be called mana in the past. So, I'm calling that now. Weird, but okay. I used the potion you gave me, but after reaching the level of 60x, I discovered that it was hard to control my mana. So, I stopped and began to practice control. Once I'm used to that level, I will continue to use the potion. A slash N, from now on. I will use X to indicate the mana of an adult wizard. So, 60x is 60 times the mana of an adult wizard. Edward nodded with his aunt's action. He did not have this problem because of how strong his soul is, but that did not apply to everyone. Soon, they reached their destination, the Department of Mysteries. The group met with a bunch of people waiting for them, to be precise, the unspeakables. Amelia looked at them and said, as I mentioned before, Edward and the person behind us will lead your research from now on fenol.cm. All the unspeakables had an excited look on their face. Ever since the new minister took office, she has financially supported their research with all her effort. And now, their department will be led by a world-famous wizard. Edward too was excited. Although he would sneak into this department to study especially when he first created his gate. But now, he had open access to all the mysteries. Plus now, he had help and more understanding of magic he could foresee that it won't be long before his gate is completed. With a smile on his face, he took out a bunch of crowns and diadems from his bag. He placed one on his head, gave one to the person behind him, then handed the rest to these unspeakables. The completion of these diadems almost broke him because of how much they costed him. Luckily, he had many philosopher's stone. He first explained the diadem's ability to increase intelligence, then he said, a group of you will go with me to study time and space, while the other will go with the person behind me to study love and death. Any questions? Seeing that no one had questions, he motioned for them to head to the meeting room, then he had a separate conversation with the hooded person. So, have you adopted to being resurrected? Yes. But I cannot believe that the world changed so much, replied Lily. That's good. Did you see your son? Harry? He has grown very well. I'm very satisfied. Well, given his situation, he indeed grew well. Lily sighed. She did not expect her sister to behave this way. However, given the situation, she was just glad that she was willing to take Harry in. When can I properly see him? Asked Lily. Soon. I can wait, but please do not forget your promise. I'm a man of my words. As long as you discover some secrets regarding love magic and death magic, I will grant you reward points. And as long as you have enough points, I can resurrect your husband for you. I will trust you for now. After that, Edward started his research on the different divisions of this department specifically, time and space. He first read all the research that the unspeakables made in the past. Although he already stole some of them, he soon discovered that the real research was hidden so thoroughly that he did not even know of their existence. Just like that, it was the end of the second year. Chapter 97 First Interdimensional Travel Test Edward was with his cousin Susan, walking her to the train. So, how did it feel to win this year's house cup, he asked. Excellent. Didn't you see how joyous Madame Sprout was? She was bragging to all her colleagues. I bet it was not as easy as you expected. Susan's mouth twitched after hearing this. Of course, it was not easy. With Hermione having access to the same knowledge as her, it was not so easy to get points. Luckily, she still had years of knowledge ahead of her, but she could foresee that in the future, things will be even more difficult. Sue, the two arrived at the train station. Are you sure you do not want me to just apparate you home? No, I want to spend some time with my friends. All right, have fun. After watching the train leave, Edward operat to his laboratory on the moon. The first thing he did was to visit his world gate. He entered the core and looked at all the enchantment. I cannot believe that I thought I reached the peak of alchemy in this world. Now, I can see so many things wrong with these enchantments that it's embarrassing. So, for the next two weeks, he removed all his previous ones and replaced them. With his understanding of dragon chant magic, his discoveries in the past few months after studying time and space in the Department of Mysteries, he innovated the entire gate. He removed some redundant or unnecessary enchantments, optimized the necessary aspects, and he added new ones to it. Looking at the completed improvements, Edward said, Perfect. Well, at least in my eyes. I'm sure that a more powerful alchemist would see many flaws in it, however, this is currently the limit of my knowledge. After everything was done, Edward first decided to take a visit into the future to steal knowledge. After studying the aging process in the time room in the Department of Mysteries, he managed to crack this ability. He activated the gate, powering through the stone. In theory, I should be able to go to more than 300 years into the future. A tunnel appeared and the world gate entered it. As for Edward, he felt like many years passed, but at the same time, he felt like an instant. After arriving at his destination, Edward left the gate. The first thing he noticed was that he was in a desert with nothing in sight. Then, a tablet was floating not far from him, with a note attached to it. The note read, To Edward Bones. With vigilance, Edward launched a reconnaissance spell. Through the vibration, he could see everything a few hundred meters around him, but he did not find anything, not even an ant. He waved his hand and the tablet flew to him. 
he opened it, and a video started to play. And in the video, he saw himself. Hello, past me. Welcome to the year 2093, frenew.cm. Only a hundred years, thought Edward. I know that you are wondering why only a hundred years passed. Well, I can tell you that because of certain restrictions of the laws of this universe, you cannot travel more than one hundred years into the future. And even that has certain restrictions. Edward frowned after hearing this, but he continued listening. Well, let's get back to business. In this tablet, I have left for you all the technological advances of this world for the past one hundred years and the knowledge on how to integrate magic and technology using the mana crystals. Although only the very basic knowledge, it should save you a lot of time, and allowing you rapid development in the early years. Now, as for magic knowledge, I will not leave any. As they said, the journey is as important as the process. Edward's mouth twitched after hearing this. He wondered since when did he get so philosophical. Now, I have a few warnings for you. First, when you start your travel to other worlds and dimensions, do not mess around with time. Even if you have the ability, do not travel through time. The same idea applies to our universe. Death was not lying when he said that there would be dire consequences for doing so. Additionally, do not revive a lot of people before you find a way to deal with death. You can still do it, but in moderation. Now, I'm sure you would like to receive more information from your future self, but this is not possible. Good luck. After the video ended, Edward sighed at how strange his life is that he just exchanged information with his future self. However, he was not planning to completely listen to him. After arriving in the future, of course, he has to acquire magical knowledge. Otherwise, his trip would be in vain. Unfortunately for Edward, as soon as that idea came to his mind, the world gate appeared on his own, swallowed him, and returned him to the present. With a flabbergasted look on his face, he smiled wryly as he muttered, it seems that my future self knows me the best. He did not try again to go to the future as he could guess that his future self might be way more powerful than him, and would prevent him from succeeding. There was no point in doing something pointless. Taking out the tablet, he started reviewing the information on the tablet. Well, my future self is very thorough, he gave me knowledge on all fields, even things like psychology and archaeology. More importantly, he seemed to know what I wanted and gave me a lot of technology on aerospace. With this knowledge, it won't only take a few decades for Earth to turn into an interstellar civilization and spread to all the corners of our solar system. With the addition of Magitech the combination of magic and technology the process would be faster and easier. This will be a great help to building the wizard civilization. After reviewing the information and making a copy of it, Edward gave it to the scientists under his commands to analyze it in detail. Then, he returned to the gate. Morgana, let's begin our first dimensional travel test. Sir, are you positive? The chances of failures are more than 95%. That's why we have to test it, see the problem and fixed it. As you command. Beginning test fusing spatial force with temporal force. Accomplish, supplying energy, no problem with energy storage, checking all enchantments, no problem detected breaking dimensional wall, recording all energy readings. Edward felt like everything was shaking around him, making it difficult to hold his ground. The process lasted for more than an hour, making him a little dizzy. After everything stopped, he said, did it work? Not enough information to answer this question. That's fair. Morgana, remind me to deal with the issue of turbulence, feol.cm. As you order. Edward checked the surroundings first from inside the gate. After seeing that there was no danger, he left. However, as soon as he did so, he paused as he noticed something around him. Chapter 98 Mana Tree As soon as Edward left the gate, he felt something odd in the surroundings. However, after checking, he did not find anything. So, he closed his eyes and felt everything around him. There is mana in the environment. Although the amount is pitiful to the point of barely being able to be detected, it still exists. Could it be that I managed to travel to another world? It should not be that easy. Insidio, said Edward. Then, he noticed that when the flame appeared from the tip of his wand, it grew 20% larger by absorbing the mana in the air. Then, Edward tried a few other spells, including dark magic, and it was the same. Having mana in the surroundings increases the power of all spells. Finally, Edward said, Defay. A flame appeared in his wand, then it also increased in size. It seems that drag enchant magic is more effective when used in a mana-filled environment. Moreover, it is more effective on using it than regular incantations magic. After doing his initial test, Edward used his gate to teleport to the moon. Well, it seems that I'm still on Earth, at least one version of it. Edward then buried a deep tunnel underground and placed the gate. Morgana, enter stealth mode. The, the gate became invisible. I should probably find a better way to hide it in the future. I can't always place it on the moon. I might encounter places that have no moon, or civilizations that have established colonies on the moon. Or powerful beings that can easily search an entire planet and discover the gate. Maybe I can place a diminuendo charm, shrinking spell, inside that allows me to turn it into a small keychain I can carry around. Or worse, just swallow and carry inside my stomach. 
The ideal hiding place would be a small and separate dimension that exists outside of time and space and belongs only to me. That way I could also place a lot of precious items not fearing them being discovered or lost. Unfortunately, I currently cannot create something like this. Wait, I do not need to create one. If I remember correctly, the soul space is also a separate dimension inside every human's body. If I could find a way to place the gate there, then it's safer would be guaranteed. Additionally, if I can link the gate to my soul, it can protect me. In case of an emergency, it can take my soul away from danger, then all I need to do is build myself a new body. Well, I will add this research to the list of long things I have to do. After sighing deeply, Edward Operat back to Earth, searching for information about where he was. After reading the minds of all the people he encountered, Edward sighed. I did not succeed, as expected. However, it seems that I now can travel to parallel universes. From the information that I have gathered, this parallel universe is currently in the late 10th century which is the time of the Hogwarts founders. However, in this reality, the four founders never met one another and became friends, they never established Hogwarts. Salazar Slytherin and Godric Gryffindor seem to have an unreconcilable grudge with one another. Their battles are famous in the magical world. What an interesting universe. However, before I go to meet these powerful wizards, I need to research the mana in the surroundings. Maybe I can find a way to activate the leyline nodes in my timeline. Without hesitation, Edward traveled to the nearest leyline node to study them. He instantly noticed that the concentration of mana is higher around these nodes. But after careful investigation, he discovered that they were not activated and releasing mana to the environment. On the contrary, they seemed to be slowly absorbing the little mana in the air, slowly turning the environment into the one similar to his time. So, he traveled to different nodes around the world, checking to see if they were the same and if there were any anomalies. Okay, now I know why there is no longer any mana in my time. However, my search proved to be futile. After sighing in disappointment, Edward looked around. He found himself in a luscious forest. The trees were tall and healthy. Because of being bathed in mana, they grew stronger and more resilient than the ones in his time. As he watched this beautiful view, he felt peaceful. Wait a minute, he muttered to himself. What if I could create a tree that can absorb mana from the leyline nodes and released it in the environment through photosynthesis? After conquering the world, as long as I plant these mana trees all over the world, mana should be able to exist freely in the surrounding. Herbology has many ways to artificially create magical plants. And if that does not work, I can also try using genetic engineering. After all, I have all the technology from my future self. With a smile on his face, he returned to his gate, planning to meet the founders tomorrow. He was quite excited. Scene break. Back to a few hours ago, an hour after Edward landed on this timeline, someone operat to the place he first appeared. It was a beautiful woman with black hair and pale skin. As soon as he arrived, she checked the environment. This is the place that I felt the tremendous spatio-temporal energy. But why isn't there anything there? Could it be that some other wizard was playing with space and time? I do not know any wizard that has such profound knowledge. Maybe my fears have come true, and something from beyond finally came to this world. Suddenly, she coughed on her sleeve. Looking at the dark blood left there, she muttered, my time is running out. She sighed, is this the price I have to pay for messing with things out of my control, things that mortals should not deal with? Chapter 99, Two Peas in a Pod. The next day, Edward stood in a front of a castle in Scotland. He could feel many powerful enchantments surrounding it. Most likely used to either detain or kill trespassers. So, he did not directly go inside, but waited for the owner to come to see him. A few minutes after his arrival, a woman wearing blue clothes and a diadem on her head, she had pale skin and luscious black hair. Edward lost his bearing for a moment, not because of how beautiful she was, but because she resembled someone she knew. Knowing that he made a social faux pas, he hurriedly said, I'm sorry, madam for coming to your home uninvited. My name is Edward Bones, and I've come a long way to meet you. The lady saluted back, and I'm Rowena Ravenclaw. I have to say, I am curious. I have met all the powerful wizards of this land, but never met or heard about you before, Renew.cm. Rowena was indeed surprised. As one of the few people in this world that broke the second limiter, she can consider herself the most powerful wizard currently alive. Yet, she discovered that the person in front of her had far more magical power than her. That's because I'm not from this world. I'm from a parallel universe, answered Edward. Could he be the reason for the spatio-temporal force that I detected yesterday? Parallel universe, said Rowena. Are you talking about the, multiple choice, multiple world theory, which states that every choice that an individual makes lead to the creation of an entire world based on that choice? Edward squinted his eyes after hearing this. Worthy to be one of the most talented witches of all time. She could understand my words so easily. I did not expect that the concept of parallel universe exist at this point in time. This theory was created by a brilliant wizard, unfortunately, he was ridiculed by the magical society to the point that he died trying to prove them wrong, said Rowena. You said at this point in time, does that mean that your world is in a future state? That's correct. Any evidence to prove so? Of course, replied Edward. 
Then, he took out Ravenclaw's diadem and handed it to Ravenclaw of his timeline. She spent a few minutes analyzing it. Fascinating. The craftsmanship, design, and aesthetics are basically the same. The only difference from mine is the fact that enchantments are much weaker and have a few flaws. Additionally, this diadem seemed to have been used for very dark magic, thus destroying it. Well, the Ravenclaw in my timeline is quite different from you. How so? Well, she was married, had a daughter, and built a school with all the other powerful wizards in this era. Rowena paused after hearing this, she remembered a few years ago, her family wanted her to marry a nice gentleman. But she refused. One witch named Helga Hufflepuff once came to see me asking me to create a school with her to teach magic to young wizards. But I was so focused on my research that I refused her. So, powerful wizard from a parallel universe, what brought you here? Exchange of knowledge, of course. Rowan Ravenclaw paused for a moment, then she finally invited Edward into her castle. They spent the next three days non-stop talking about magic. Edward sighed after drinking a potion that prevented him from being hungry. This is the first time I met someone that has the same drive and desire for knowledge as me, as well as being able to keep up with my thoughts in a discussion. The feeling is mutual, responded Rowena. In this timeline, her talent is truly unmatched, so a few people could keep up with her. Furthermore, because of the patriarchal nature of this era, most wizards do not like being outmatched by a witch in terms of knowledge and skill. So, her exchange with others often ended in disappointment. Now that we have established a certain level of trust, I can ask you to use a magic that links our mind together to exchange knowledge quicker and more efficiently, said Edward. Rowena paused for a moment, then she nodded. Soon afterward, she found herself in her mindscape. In half, the room was a library of all her knowledge, while on the other was Edward's. Well, this is the first time I met someone who has at least half of my knowledge. This all the magical knowledge you have, asked Rowena Ravenclaw in surprise. Well, not all of them are magical in nature. There is some history and technology there too. Technology? You will soon know. Immediately afterward, the two exchange many of their knowledge, theories, memories, skills, and experiments. The process lasted at least a year in the mindscape and one hour in real life. After waking up, Rowena was completely fine. She reviewed all the information she just gathered. I cannot believe that muggles would develop so much in just a thousand years, meanwhile, us wizards have deteriorated to such a point. Well, you cannot completely blame them. Mana is no longer in the environment in my time, so the likelihood of powerful wizards being born has dramatically increased, replied Edward, however, he had a frown on his face. That is not reason enough to reach such a state, replied Rowena. Is there a problem? It seems that you do not completely trust me. What do you mean? In my timeline, I studied the diadem and concluded that my Ravenclaw probably had access to the room of brain in the Department of Mysteries. By studying that room, she was able to discover how to increase intelligence and made the diadem. However, I found no such information during our exchange. More importantly, I did not find the reason that you are slowly dying. Rowena paused for a moment before sighing. I knew that I would not be able to hide it from you. Follow me. She then led Edward to a long passage in her castle, heading in a specific direction. There is no need to sulk. I'm sure that there are many things that you hid from me during our exchange. That may be true, replied Edward. However, you have to admit that the level of trust one gave you is way more than you did me. With an awkward silence, the two soon reached a room. Inside, Edward saw the perfect replica of the Department of Mysteries. He saw the Room of Time, Space, Love, Brain, and the Death Chamber. He even saw the Hall of Prophecy. It seems that my deduction was correct. Rowena Ravenclaw in my timeline might have found these rooms while traveling throughout the world and brought them back to England. Later, the location she placed them before her death was probably discovered by other wizards who started studying them. From what I remember, the oldest record of the Department of Mysteries was traced back to 1672, while the Ministry of Magic was created in 1707. The wizards who chose the location of the ministry were probably aware of these magical wonders and wanted to hide or protect them. Regaining his thought, Edward asked, Do these things have anything to the reason you are dying? Yes. I discovered the room of space and time in the same place. However, an accident occurred in the process of retrieving them, replied Rowena. Where did you find them? It was the place called, Bermuda's Triangle, in your time. Chapter 100 Death's True Identity Bermuda Triangle? Edward knew that this was a mysterious place in the North Atlantic Ocean where many muggles' planes and aircraft have disappeared. He once visited that place and noticed a weird spatial ripple there, and studied it for a while. Although he gained a lot, he never truly uncovers the cause of it. What about the others? Where did you find them? The Brain Room was discovered in Africa, the Hall of Prophecy in New Zealand, the Love Room in America, and the Death Room in Greece. Wait, you said Greece. Did you encounter something strange in the process? hurriedly asked Edward. How did you know? replied Rowena. The death chamber was in the possession of a Greek wizard. The man was extremely powerful and also very mad. He rumbled about how he would soon become a god, truly becoming immortal and control the power of death itself. 
What happened afterward, F-E-E-E-N-L.C. Calm down, replied Rowena Ravenclaw. I was easily defeated and captured by him. However, he did not immediately kill me. He seems to want someone to witness his ascension to godhood. He was using some kind of very complicated ceremonial magic that needed the death chamber as a basis. So, I secretly modified some parts of the ceremony, and he failed. He died in front of me. I should have guessed that it was him, the ancient Greek wizard, Herpo the Fowl. The first dark wizard to create a basilisk and the inventor of the Horcrux, muttered Edward. If I guess right, he might succeed in becoming a god in my timeline. But how did he do it? He once told me that there were other gods in this universe, but they were forced to return to the fundamental laws of this universe. Now, he could have lied to me, but assuming he was not. Edward then walked back and forth with his hand on his chin. Since Herpo needed the chamber of death, then this relic should be related to these previous gods. Or maybe things they left after disappearing. So, based on the different rooms, there used to be the god of death, time, space, and fate. The brain room could relate to intelligence or wisdom, so the god of wisdom? It could be thoughts, knowledge, mind, and spirit. Or a god related to all of those things. Then there is the room of love. God of love? No, in ancient runes and many other languages, love can be interpreted as guardian or protection. No, it can also be interpreted as life. Hence, the god of life. This would explain why after sacrificing herself, Lily Potter was able to protect her son from a death-related spell like the killing curse. Her action falls under the categories of guardian and life protection. So, with time, space, life, death, mind, and wisdom, we have all the necessary components for creating a universe and living beings to make it flourish. Not just that. If, the cataclysm, occurred as Herpo stated, they might need these things to stabilize the universe from destroying or something else. As for Herpo, he must create a way for him to absorb or merge with the laws of death of this universe and becoming a god. Unfortunately for him, even after succeeding, he was stuck in the afterlife, unable to enjoy all that power. And now, he wants to find a way to escape, and it's necessary to activate the leyline nodes for him to succeed. And there might even be some traps in those deathly hallows. To be safe, in the future, I will place all of them very far apart. After finishing talking to himself out loud, Edward looked at Rowena who staring and listening to him intently, he asked, Do you remember the magic that you saw Herpo using? I did, replied Rowena, then she took a grey string from her temple, waved it into the air, showing that particular memory. Edward saw a snake-looking old man with a long white beard holding a long cane with a snake design on the top, he seemed to be using it as a wand. In the center of the room was the death chamber, and around it was countless strange writings and symbols written on the floor and murals. In one part, there was a small hill of crystal. After focusing on that part, Edward realized that they were souls. Let me see these are ancient Greek enchantments, ancient runes, and even dragon language. I can't believe that Herpo also knew about dragon chant magic. Did he recreate a dragon as I did, or did he find the remains of the dragon race? Then, Edward continued to analyze the enchantments, he recognized other things like the devil language he used for his contract. However, many things he also did not recognize. He theorized that they were enchantments based on long-dead languages, or it might even be a language created personally by Herpo the Fowl for this magic. After more than an hour, he finally turned his head to see Rowena staring at him very intently. Thinking about something, he smiled wryly, All right, I promised you that I will show the knowledge that I learned during our exchange. Before that, I need your analysis of this magic. Rowena kept staring at him for a few more seconds, then she replied, I will trust this time. She waved her hand and a large book appeared, she then handed it to him. Edward briefly looked through it and he saw all of Rowena's research on the ceremony magic. Although she could not recognize many of the enchantments there, after many experiments, she figured more than 50% of them. Nodding his head, Edward took out a circular plate and handed it to her, this plate was the same that he gave the Death Eaters, given them access to his library. Knowledge of how to operate this metal plate appeared in her mind, then she asked, why is my authority temporary level 4? Don't be greedy. Only I have level 5 access, and only my family have real level 4 access. So, what you're saying is that if I become your wife, I will have real level 4 access, and even possibly level 5? Asterisk cough asterisk, cough, I'm a man who is impossible to be tied to one woman. It's fine if you have many women as long as I get to be the main one. Well, let's change the subject. Where did your illness come from? Show me the source and I may be able to find a solution. Rowena gave him a profound look before saying, the source of my illness came from the same place as the time and space room. You mean the Bermuda Triangle? What exactly is there? Chapter 101 The Way Forward Rowena and Edward Operat to the Bermuda Triangle After a glance, Edward realized that it looked similar to his timeline, with the same strange spatial fluctuations. Then, he saw Rowena took out an item, then a vortex appeared in front of them. Then, the two of them entered the vortex. Soon afterward, Edward found himself in a very dark place, so he used the Lumos charm to see his surroundings. There is a separate space connected to the Bermuda Triangle. I never discovered it in my timeline. 
I used the Hall of Prophecy to amplify my divination magic to locate all the different rooms. After arriving in this place, I created an alchemy item that helped me enter this place. Keep up, there is still some way to go. Edward then hurriedly followed her. After more than 30 minutes walk. Then, Edward saw a sight that he probably would never forget in his life. In front of him was a large vortex, and through this vortex was a white world full of sparkles. Each sparkle had different intensity, yet they still shined brilliantly and beautifully. Edward felt like he was looking at stars at night, and the sight was breathtaking. What is this? he asked in shock. Chaos, the world beyond our world, or outside of our universe. You can call it with many names, replied Rowena. You mean void. Void? That's a good name. Then Edward suddenly started laughing out loud like a madman, and even some small tears fell from his eyes. Rowena could not tell whether because he laughed too much, or because of pure joy. After regaining his bearing, Edward said, according to my theory, there exist worlds, universes, or dimensions completely separate from our own. And in between these universes, there should exist something, void. Finally, my theory has been proven correct. This is not enough of you to be this happy. You don't understand. All this different world means different magic civilizations and power systems. Some that are way better than ours, some that are not, and some that are completely different. Nonetheless, it is still completely new knowledge. Rowena's eyes light up after hearing, meanwhile, Edward continued to vent his emotions. After sighing deeply, he said, R.O.N.U.L.M. One of my greatest and most ambitious goals was to travel to these worlds and acquire their knowledge. But I knew that this would not be an easy process. So, I study a way to acquire immortality so I can have time to do so. And later, I decided to conquer the planet and use the wisdom of all wizards and muggles to help me accomplish my goal. Even then, I knew that things would not go easy. However, with this discovery, I finally see hope for my goal to be achieved. So, I would like to thank you sincerely. Rowena nodded her head, as a fellow who travels the same path of discovering the essence of magic, I accept your thanks. Edward took a deep breath, his eyes changed as they twinkle when looking at Rowena. Okay, let's deal with your problem now. Tell me what's going on? Nodding her head, she explained, when I first came here, the room of space and room of time were located here, connected to the vortex. They seem to be slowly closing the vortex. I was curious about it, so I started studying it. Unfortunately, in one of my experiments, something came out from the void and entered my body. This strange power started infecting my body. Although I managed to prevent it from spreading, it slowly weakens me. Edward walked to her and used his wand to check her injury. He soon discovered a black light inside of her body. All her body is infected, including both her bloodline and magic core. This could explain why she never broke the last limiter. Luckily, she managed to stop this thing from spreading to all her soul, and only a small part is affected. Do you have a solution? asked Rowena. Well, if you do not, it's okay. I've had a long time to make peace with my death. It's just a shame that my life would come to an end so quickly without accomplishing so many things. There is no need to be negative as I do have a way, it's just that a few things need to be dealt with. Really, what method? First of all, you need to give up your current body. Give up my body? You want to use clone. That's right. Clone you and place your soul in the new body, replied Edward. That's a good method, but there will still be the issue of my soul. Here lies the problem. I do not have nearly enough understanding of this strange thing to remove it from your soul. So, the best solution is to use magic similar to Horcrux and cut that the part of your soul that is infected. However, doing so would make your soul incomplete. Although the soul can slowly heal itself, the process is extremely long compared to the human body. So, we need to find a way to make up for that missing piece. I guess that the elixir of immortality may have a way to make up for it, but I've never tested it, so I'm not entirely sure. Rowena's eyes light up after hearing this, if you want a way to make up for the soul, then we need to find Salazar Slytherin. Him? What for? In this timeline, he invented a way to turn muggles into pure soul energy and crystallize it. This is the reason that Godric Gryffindor hates him and constantly tries to kill him. In that case, let's visit him and the other founders. Then, we can travel to my timeline to treat you. Sai I should have come with all my research and laboratory equipment. I need to make a mental note for the future. What about you studying the void? It can wait until we return to my timeline. I'm sure this vortex also exists there. Well, this might not be the case, replied Rowena. What do you mean? Although I only removed the rooms of space and time because I was desperate to find a way to live and wanted to study all the mysterious rooms to discover a solution to my problem, I still care about the vortex. So, after moving the rooms, I still checked on it and discovered that it was slowly closing on its own. The rooms acted as an amplifier to the process. So, there is a chance that they might be already close on my timeline, added Edward. In that case, we just have to return here after you are healed. There is no need for so much trouble. After we get the information from Slytherin, we can come back here to study. From my calculation, I can last for 10 to 15 years. Edward frowned, you should be aware that the longer we take to treat you, the larger part of your soul that will be affected? I know that. 
but I have a feeling that a mysterious change is slowly taken place in my soul because of that weird thing, and it is a good kind of change. So, I plan to allow it to take place. After I get a new body and heal my soul, I will absorb this strange thing again and allow it to slowly transform me, and once I can no longer hold on, I will use the same method to cut it off me. Then, I will repeat the process again and again until the transformation is over, e.c. After hearing this, Edward did not try to convince her as he would probably do the same thing in her situation. The only difference being that he would be more careful and experimented on other people before doing it on himself. After agreeing, the two left to meet the other founders of that time. Chapter 102 Second Interdimensional Travel Test Soon afterward, Edward and Rowena went to meet the different founders and have a discussion and exchange. The process was actually smoother than Edward expected, and it was because all of them really respected Rowena Ravenclaw. So, without any difficulty, he learned a few things from each of them. He learned the soul crystal magic from Slytherin, along with much other dark magic. Although the soul crystal magic allows Edward to turn souls into pure energy that can be absorbed without any impurities, there were still a lot of problems with this magic that he needed to fix himself. From Gryffindor, he learned a lot of skills when using magic. Skills are as important as using powerful magic as they can allow a weaker opponent to defeat a much more powerful one. A perfect example of skills is a memory that Edward saw from Godric Gryffindor during one of his duels with Slytherin. The latter used Accio to call Slytherin's wand from him, thus disarming the latter without using the Expelliarmus charm. From Helga Hufflepuff, he learned food-related charms and recipes. And it was not just that the food she made was delicious, but had other properties. Her food could help regulate the body to keep wizards and muggles healthy, it can help soothe people's minds and allows them to be in their best state to study or do other activities. Her food could quicken a wizard's ability to create mana. And unlike Edward's potion, the food tasted excellent, had fewer side effects on the body. Of course, it was not as effective as the potion. However, through everyday consumption, it could make up for it. Edward learned a great deal when it comes to magic diet, and was inspired to invite a few potions based on some of the recipes he learned from her. As for Helga, after meeting Edward, she was motivated to make her dream come true and build Hogwarts in this timeline. She invited the others to help, unfortunately, only Gryffindor accepted her invitation. However, Edward did help her write the books for the different curriculum. After that, Edward returned to Bermuda Triangle to study the Void Entrance. Once there, he had two problems to solve to achieve interdimensional travel, being able to enter the Void on his own without the help of the entrance, and surviving there. The first problem was easier to achieve. With two of the greatest mind in the magical world working together, adding to that Rowena's previous research on the entrance, it only took the two half a year to find a way to open a portal outside the universe, to the void. Soon after that came the real problem, finding a material that could actually survive in the void. According to tests made by these two, anything that they send there was instantly destroyed. No matter what metals or ores, they were destroyed. Whether it was soul or mana, it was also destroyed. Edward even tried sending some law power from the Deathly Hallows and it was also destroyed. Although the process took approximately 48 hours, the only thing that managed to survive the void and returned intact was the Philosopher's Stone. Even the Lesser Stone only lasted three months before being destroyed in the void. After getting this result, Edward and Rowena began to use transmutation to create a special metal based on the properties of the Greater Philosopher's Stone. It took them nearly 10 years to succeed, and in the process, these two traveled to different timelines in search of knowledge and meeting different famous wizards of history. Once they succeed, Edward had to return to his own timeline as Rowena's body was failing faster than she anticipated. Luckily for him, despite how long he spent traveling, only six hours passed from when he left. After taking Rowena to the laboratory to have herself cloned, he made sure that she was all right before leaving. Since she could cut off the part of her soul that was infected on her own, he did not need to stay around. Edward first checked the Bermuda Triangle of his own timeline. Unfortunately, as Rowena previously theorized, it was already closed. So, he returned to the void entrance in her timeline. In the next year, Edward dismantled his world gate and rebuilt it with magician which the name he chose for the new metal based on the principle that famous metals in comics like vibranium, adamantium, all ended in eum. Looking at the new gate that was purple in color, Edward was very satisfied. This new metal will be another foundation for his magical civilization, just like vibranium was to the people of Wakanda. Morgana, began the first test. Send the gate to void. As you command. The space around the gate trembled before it disappeared completely. An hour later, the gate appeared again. What the status? asked Edward. Sir, no signs of destruction or being eroded. All enchantments are working perfectly fine, no problem with energy reserve or distribution. Good. Now, let's begin phase two of the test. Edward entered inside the gate before activating it to enter the void again. Morgana began to scatter probes to search for any worlds. Executing command, unknown error, unknown error. Then, the entire gate started to shake violently. Give me a diagnose of the situation, yelled Edward. Scanning, detecting a powerful force pulling us back to the universe. 
Can you detect the source of the pulling force? Calculating, unknown. After sighing, Edward just waited for things to unfold. A few minutes later, everything stopped. Show me an image of the outside. Soon, a vision of the surroundings appeared in front of Edward. He found himself in a luscious forest, making everything green. In front of him was a small wooden hut, with an old man standing in front of him. The old man seemed to be able to perceive Edward's surveillance and said, You can come out, young man. With a frown on his face, Edward quickly assessed the situation. Then, he took out a philosopher's stone and swallowed. Afterward, he placed a ring on his finger which was actually his only obscurus. After preparing, he got out. The old man looked at Edward up and down and said, Quite careful. If you retain that level of prudence, you will not be in this situation. With his guard still up, Edward asked, Who are you? And why did you pull me here? The old man caressed his long white beard and said, My name is Merdin, but I'm sure you know me as Merlin, fno.co. You're Merlin known as the greatest wizard in this world? Well, the title is a little exaggerated, but I'm indeed that Merlin. It's an honor to me you, replied Edward, but he did not let his guard down. So, Sir Merlin, for what purpose you called me here? It's because you were careless. What do you mean? Interdimensional travel is not a joke, yet you treated it so carelessly. The first thing that you did was to send a probe into the void. Do you have any idea how dangerous that is? As intelligent as you are, you should be able to guess that there are creatures capable of living in the void. Now, what would happen if they discovered your probe and traced it back to you? Cold sweat started falling down Edward's back after hearing this. And that's not the only mistake you made. The void is vast beyond anything you can imagine. You could spend millions of years without finding another world. Even if you are immortal, can you imagine the suffering you would endure in that time? On top of that, even if you find another world, what then? Do you just barge in just like that? If you are lucky and discover a weak world, everything would be fine. But if you discovered one of those powerful worlds with beings that can control space and time, they would immediately detect your presence and capture you. And with your weak strength, there is little you could do. Edward almost died of embarrassment. He was so caught up in his discovery of the void that he forgot all his cautiousness in doing things. Adding the fact that things have been going too well for him for most of his life, he was careless beyond reason. And that's not all, continued Merlin. Even if everything went smoothly and you managed to travel to another world, how would you return to this one? Do you think that the little coordinate you left in this world would be enough for you to locate it from the void? Furthermore, let's say that everything went smoothly for you and you did successfully return to this world. How do you prevent other powerful beings that can travel through the void to use you to locate our universe and invade it? Young man, you are much better than this. Taking a deep breath to calm himself down, Edward said, Thank you, Sir Merlin, for your guidance. Well, as long as you understand. Merlin then took a book out of nowhere and gave it to Edward. With a puzzled look on his face, Edward took a brief look at the book and he was quite surprised. This book contained many enchantments that would help him deal with all the problems that Merlin mentioned before. He was fascinated by the content, and Edward had to admit that many of these enchantments were far beyond his understanding. He always thought that after breaking the third limiter that he reached a similar height to Merlin, but how wrong he was. Raising his head to say thank the old wizard again, however, there was no one in sight even the old wooden hut was gone. After sighing deeply, he still said his thanks out loud, then he returned to his gate and left. Meanwhile, inside the hut, Merlin watched Edward left as he talked to himself. I wonder how far this talented young lad could go? Void life form? Omniversal existence? Nexus being? Or even an aspect? That would be a sight to see. Ho ho ho, I look forward to it. When he succeeds, these old guys can no longer say that I only trained Arthur to the top of the food chain, eeol. Meanwhile, in a tower that looked like a prison, a beautiful woman with an evil temperament was looking through a window. She looked in the direction that Edward disappeared and muttered, did that old guy Merlin endorse someone new? Then she sneered, probably some unlucky guy that will easily die in the void. A slash n, phew, what a long chapter. A few things to say, personally, I would like to write more of Edward's interaction with the founders, his exploit in different timelines, and show the development of his romance with Rowena Ravenclaw as I consider her the main female protagonist of this story. Unfortunately, I really want interdimensional travel to begin and to write about that. The Harry Potter world went longer than anticipated and I still have a few more things to write about it. Chapter 103 A Revolution of Ideas After he met with Merlin, Edward returned to his timeline. Then, he spent the next three days reading and understanding the enchantments that the book contained. Although only gaining an initial understanding of it, he was fascinated by its content. For example, one enchantment allows him to use luck so that he can always discover a world in the void, it has similar properties to the Felix Felicis or Liquid Luck Potion. Another enchantment used the power of fate to be able to locate this world. The entire idea of it is the fact that each individual is born with a fated star, and by tracking that star, Edward can find his way home from the void. After seeing that, he immediately thought of Harry Potter. As the chosen one of this universe, his fate star must be unique and the best one to track. And there were so many more things in the book, and Edward knew that it would take him a long time to completely understand its content. 
And after his previous experience, he became more cautious. Afterward, he contacted his aunt. Is everything ready? Yes. You just need to do your part, responded Amelia. All right. Scene break. An assembly took place in a large stadium with thousands of wizards from all over the world. Many people waited with bated breath as they looked at the stadium in the middle. Around the stadium were many cameras both magical and technological filming and taking pictures of this event. Soon after everyone calmed down, a red flame appeared in the stadium and Edward appeared in the middle, dressed in an expensive-looking suit and long windbreaker. All the members of the audience started applauding after he appeared, and it lasted for a good five minutes before they quiet down. I know that many of you are here to see what kind of groundbreaking invention that I came up with this time, unfortunately, this is not the reason for this assembly. Nevertheless, I believe that what I'm about to say is way more important than any possible invention. The crowd stood up straight as they listened. So, Edward continued. There is something very wrong with our society. We wizards can wield the elements of nature to do our biddings, we can play with the soul, travel through space and time, and even conquer death. Yet, we are forced to hide in a corner of the world like rats in a sewer. Does that make any sense? Edward paused for a moment to allow his words to seminate. We are forced to hide our extraordinary nature to the world. Worst, sometimes, we even have to pay for it for exposing it. If any of you here in the audience were to expose magic to the non-magical or use magic to harm a non-magical even if your actions were justified, you will be imprisoned for your actions. And in some countries, may even face the death penalty. The audience ponder his words, and they sighed as they realized that he was right. Now, I'm sure many of you are blaming ordinary humans for this situation. But I can tell you that I'm not here to disseminate ideas of hatred of the non-magical, or superiority over them. In the past century, two people have tried such method, and history has proven that their ideas rooted in supremacy is not the right path. So, I'm here to offer an alternative solution, integration. Integrating wizard society with the non-magical. Combining the positive of each side to form something new, something better. Once again, Edward briefly paused to allow the audience to contemplate his words. Now, I know that many of you might be wondering what the non-magical world has to offer us, wizard. I will show you. With a wave of his wand, a large image appeared in the stadium, it showed the development of science and technology in the past hundred years. Without the use of magic or any extraordinary abilities, they have created ways to travels that are faster than our carriages, ways to fly in the sky, medicine to cure diseases, way to communicate with one another globally. They even started to explore the vast universe. Some of these achievements are things that we wizard never even dreamt of, let alone attempt. Now, imagine if we bought the magical and non-magical world work together, all the things we can achieve. Imagine if we can use science and technology to make up for the deficiency of magic, or use magic to make supplement technology. Imagine the world we could build together. A future like this would not only be beautiful, but full of endless possibility. Edward looked around, and with quick use of legitimacy, he discovered that the majority of people agreed with his words, but some doubters did not think that combining magic and technology was needed. They believe that anything science can do, magic can do it better. I know that some of you are not convinced of my words, so I will give a demonstration. Does anyone knows a witch named Lily Potter? The audience nodded their heads. In the past few months, the British Ministry of Magic honored her for her sacrifice in the fight against Voldemort. Furthermore, many news people covered her story and her heroic deeds. What if I tell you that I managed to bring her back to life using both magic and technology? The audience gasped. Many people thought that Edward was joking. After all, this was the resurrection of the dead that he was talking about. Many people have lost someone they care about. And even if they have not, this cannot be guaranteed for the future. Edward smiled, then made a waving motion. Soon, the floor of the stage moved and someone slowly floated up. The audience gasped again as they recognized her face from the newspaper. The members of the Order Phoenix were the most shocked as Lily was once their companion. Harry Potter who, attending this assembly with his godfather Sirius was trembling after seeing the face of Lily. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, in the flesh. In my pursuit of understanding death, I realize that to resurrect someone, two things are needed, a body and a soul. The soul aspect could be achieved with magic, but whatever I did, I could not recreate a perfect human body. So, I look in the direction of the non-magical world for ideas and inspiration. There, I discovered the technology of cloning or being able to copy an entire person with a single drop of blood. So, I combined the advantage of the two worlds to achieve this miracle that you see in front of you. During the entire monologue, Lily's eyes were only focused on one thing, her son. After Edward nodded to her, she operat next to Harry and Sirius. Harry, my son. Mother, is that really you? Then the two rushed in each other's arms, hugging one another like they were the only things in the world. Isn't that beautiful? Edward's voice echoed throughout the stadium. This kind of miracle was only possible because I decided to integrate two different but complementary worlds together. So, my fellow wizards and witches, today, I invite all of you here to help me create a world where miracles like this occur every single day. Chapter 104 Expanding Influence 
Inside a classroom at Hogwarts, all the members of the Order of Phoenix were together, surrounding Lily. However, two people were absent. Albus, is there any problem with her? asked McGonagall. No. Her body, mind, and soul are fine. There is nothing wrong with her resurrection well, as far as my knowledge goes, replied Dumbledore with a sigh. The other members were then relieved especially Sirius and Harry. Then, all the members started talking to and asking questions. Lily, what about James? Was he resurrected with you? asked Sirius. Unfortunately, no, replied Lily. Why not? Lily just shook her. With Edward's personality and the absence of Snape here today, a few people could guess the situation. They secretly sighed as they realized the situation of the Order has further been compromised. And the person most concerned about this situation is Dumbledore. With Edward's ideas of peace and unity, he did not know how many of the members agreed with his ideals even he was tempted. Although he knew that these members would follow him despite this, he did not want to force them to do certain things against their wishes. After all, the Order was created to fight the harms that Voldemort was doing to the magical world. Scene break. A month passed since Edward's first assembly. Since then, he had so many that it was hard to count. He traveled across the world, across all continents he went to France, Germany, Italy, Spain, USA, Canada, South America, Russia, China, Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa, Algeria, etc., to spread his ideas in the magical communities. And every time he passed by one of these countries, he garnered a massive following of wizards who believe and share his vision for the future. And he did not just talk to them but show them what they could achieve. He preached about the need for further increasing magical knowledge through studying magic like science, he lured many people with immortality and the possibility of resurrecting their loved ones. He showed his followers his library and introduced the system of rewards points that he used on the Death Eaters. He preached about creating a mighty empire that spends across galaxies and dimensions. At some point in time, Edward felt like he was Jesus Christ preaching about the words of God. Actually, some of his followers even started worshipping him as a god. Of course, everything did not go smoothly. Sir, we have located different groups of rebels, said one of the followers. Just because they disagree with my ideas does not mean that they are rebels. Where are they? asked Edward. A map of different parts of the world was shown to him. He looked at it and said, mobilize the team to catch all of them in one fell swoop, and I will personally go after the largest group. Remember, we can incapacitate them, but do not kill them. Sir, why do we have to be lenient to these reb, these people? So far, our revolution has been without much bloodshed, and we should try to remain as such. These people are just lost souls, and with enough time, they can be convinced. Furthermore, even if they cannot, they are still be used as experiment materials. After that, Edward took a group of followers and operat to Australia. Soon, they managed to track this group. Edward looked at this group of thousands of wizards, he said, the new changes of the magical world are inevitable, and for the betterment of all wizard kind, why resist? Edward Bones, you might have fooled all these people, but it will not change the fact that you are just a power-hungry dark wizard just like Voldemort and Grindelwald. How dare you treat our leader the same as those scums, screamed one of the followers. However, Edward raised his hand to prevent them from doing anything rash. It's a shame that we could not see eye to eye, he then looked at his followers and said, do not intervene. He slowly walked to this group of wizards, and as soon as he took the first step, those wizards attacked. More than a thousand lights of different colors hit Edward head on. Yet, without even using a shield, he was completely unharmed. We know L. O. So, he continued his journey toward this group, while his followers watched in awe. So, this is the power of the Dragon Man magic veins? Granting me unimaginable magic resistances. And this is just one of the many benefits. As Edward slowly approached, the leader of these groups of wizards became more scared, so he screamed, don't stop shooting, he is just a man. Am I? asked Edward who instantly appeared in front of the leader, forcing him to take a step back. Ignoring the leader, he looked at the people behind him and said, brothers and sisters, lay down your wand and join me in creating a new and beautiful world. Many people hesitated after hearing this, so Edward took this opportunity. You should have heard of my deeds. I have always accepted people joining my cause even when they have previously raised their hands against me. A few seconds later, one person left the group and stood behind Edward. Then, one after another, people walked behind him until only half of them left. As for the remaining half, they gritted their teeth and raised their wands. With a sigh, Edward took out his wand and said, Stupefy. A white light appeared and all these wizards including the leader. Then, he motioned for his followers to take care of the passed out wizards, while Edward returned to his base in England. However, not long after he arrived, Snape entered his resting room with news. What is it, Severus? Dumbledore has disappeared? What do you mean he disappeared? I mean he completely vanished from sight. He cannot even be found in the Marauder's map you handed for me to watch over. Edward frowned, what about the other members of the Order? All their current location is known. Edward tapped his fingers on his chair as he thought to himself. So, this is the choice you made? I'll be ready then. I'm sure our battle will be won for the history books. Ignore Dumbledore for now, ordered Edward. 
now that the magical world is conquered, it's time to focus on the muggle side. Underscore 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 underscore. Chapter 105 Resistance, I. Edward sat in a room with some of his most trusted individuals or subordinates. Sir, we have received news from the muggle think tank that everything went according to plan. As of now, we have controlled all the political leaders of the world, taken control of the nuclear launch codes, and disarmed most militaries. Additionally, we also control all the major financial institutions, the media, and all the elite 1%, reported Bellatrix with a calm face. How did we accomplish all of this? asked Josh Delton. Many people looked at him weirdly, making him a little embarrassed. He is a new member of the circle who was just promoted due to his outstanding performance in the Werewolf Legion. It was quite easy actually. Many of these powerful people were lured with the promise of immortality, some had their memories tampered with, others were placed under the imperious curse, and some signed soul contracts. More importantly, we did not give them any chance to react and we struck at the same time. Josh Delton nodded his head, while Edward had a pensive look on his face. I'm guessing that there is a but behind all this good news. You are correct, sir. A group of soldiers armed with modern heavy weapons suddenly disappeared along with a few nuclear submarines. The odd part is that they were from different countries around the world. You mean that they were aware of our plans beforehand and acted before we got to them? Are you saying that there are traitors among us? asked Snape. It may not be a simple act of treachery, added Professor Flitwick. Since these people were from different parts of the world, they might be a secret organization or an alliance of some sort. Flitwick is correct, reported Bellatrix. From the files we recovered from the CIA, MI6, KGB, Mossad, and China's Central External Liaison Department, these countries discovered the existence of wizards since World War I and have been secretly prepared. They have conducted studies to assess the threat that wizards pose to Muggle society. Furthermore, they have brainwashed and trained young children to infiltrate magical schools all over the world to spy on the magical world and steal knowledge. With this knowledge, they have secretly trained wizards loyal to their countries by adopting orphan children with magical abilities and brainwashing them at a young age. Another tactic they used is to threaten some muggle-born wizards with their families and loved ones. The majority of people in the room were quite shocked after hearing this. All of them thought that the international statute of secrecy prevented wizards all over the world from revealing themselves to muggles, but this was nothing but a false sense of security. The upper echelons of muggle society have long known of their existence and were preparing in case a war broke out between the two sides. Many people then remembered Edward's ideals that wizards should not hide, but integrate into society, and strive to improve themselves. This new information made the beliefs of these followers more pious. There is still an issue, said Edward. How could soldiers with heavy weapons like tanks and jets suddenly disappear without a trace? Especially with how rapid our attack was? Our current theory is that one wizard used an undetectable extension charm on a suitcase, then a shrinking charm to reduce the size of these objects and place them inside. So, what you are saying is that there is a suitcase out there in this vast world, full of soldiers and modern weapons in it, summarized Edward. Bellatrix just nodded her head. After pondering for a while, Edward said, contact Nicholas Flamel and ask him to use divination to locate these people. A few minutes later, Bellatrix reported back, Nicholas just sent us a location. However, according to him, he was unable to acquire the visual of the surrounding, just a location. Since there might be some unknown factor in the situation, I will go alone, said Edward. Sir, there is no need to risk your lives, it's better to send a squad to check out the situation. Many people agreed with this statement, however, Edward insisted and used the fact that he did not want to lose any of his men when their revolution was so close to success. Of course, this act further increased his followers' loyalty. Scene break. Edward found himself in a cold and mountainous area in Russia. Snow covered his sight for miles on. However, not long after he arrived at his destination, many wizards appeared to surround him. A few of the wizards held suitcases in their hands, and with a wave of their wands, countless soldiers and machines came out of the case. With a calm look on his face, Edward looked at all the soldiers, he could quickly identify that they were all from different countries, races, and ethnicities. About 50,000 soldiers, so an entire corps, thought Edward. Then his vision landed on the person in front who was the commander of this army. Just by looking at him, he could tell that he was American. I knew you would come alone, Edward Bones. The analysis we made of you was correct, you probably only came here to show your military might to your followers, however, your overconfidence will be your downfall, said the American commander. Oh, what else did your analysis say about me? That despite the fact you constantly preach about integrating nomage with wizards, you still favor wizards over ordinary people. I resent these accusations, said Edward. There is no need to act calm. Men, fire you weapons. Rain of bullets started falling on Edward, along with tanks shooting, bazookas, and missiles. However, a shield surrounded his body, blocking all these attacks. Not even a single scratch was left on him. However, a frown was on his face during the process. At this rate, the rate that my mana decreases is quite noticeable. 
So, he raised his wand and waved it in the air. A strange field appeared around him. Then, the soldiers soon noticed something odd. All their bullets deviated from Edward and never actually touched him. As for Edward, he nodded in satisfaction as this projectile misdirection charm that he specially invented to deal with modern weapons. Wizard squad, start attacking, roared the commander. Then, countless lights hit Edward's shield. As those charms were not projectile, they were not affected by the previous spell. Nevertheless, these attacks seemed useless. Hmm, muttered Edward as he noticed his shield slowly weaken. You guys actually invented a disarming shield spell? Unlike you wizards that have stagnated and not progressed for hundreds of years, we have studied magic in death in the past few decades and made some achievements. Hee <laughs> hee, now. I'm more interested in you guys. Then, Edward changed the frequency of his shield to that of dragon chant magic, and it was stabilized. This act flustered all these wizards, along with the commander. All right, let's end the charade, announced Edward. Chapter 106, Resistance, 2. Edward looked directly into one of the wizard's eyes. However, a few seconds later, the latter screamed and fell to the floor, dead. They actually developed a charm that placed locked on a person's memory? However, this cannot completely stop me, muttered Edward. Then, he kept using legimency to read these wizards' memories, and every time he failed, the lock on their minds will immediately kill them. During the entire process, the soldiers never stopped firing their guns. Although the bullets and missiles never actually hit Edward, they still did not stop trying. Additionally, the other wizards were still firing spells at him. As long as I drain his magic power, I will be the final victor. Edward Bones is the key that glues the current magical world together. As long as he is dead, they will turn back into backward rats hiding in a corner, always fearing when they will be discovered. Soldiers, keep firing. Do not forget what you are fighting for, roared the commander. Meanwhile, after the tenth attempt, Edward managed to crack the lock on their memories. So, he proceeded to read the minds of these 200 elite wizards trained to be soldiers. He then sighed. Not only did he see their knowledge, but he also their brutal training methods. These wizards were completely brainwashed and treated as nothing but weapons for this global organization that saw wizards as a threat and planned how to neutralize or kill them. Although this may be hypocritical coming from me, let me release you from your suffering. Protego Diabolica. A blue flame surrounded Edward and started burning these wizards one by one. In just a few seconds, more than twenty of them were burned into ashes. Then, the flame transformed into a giant demonic dragon with wings. And with this transformation, became even more deadly. After another fifty wizards were killed, they finally acted. Finite, said all those wizards, thus creating a protecting enchantment around Edward and the demonic dragon flame. So, these guys even know about Grindelwald's act of almost destroying Paris in 1927? Unfortunately for them, I'm not Grindelwald. Edward waved his wand and another demonic dragon flame manifested, it started wreaking havoc among these wizards. After killing more than two-thirds of these wizards, Edward felt something and looked around him, however, he saw nothing. Then, his eyes glow and he finally saw a bunch of soldiers around directly attacking his shield. Cloaking technology? No, it's not that simple. Someone enchanted these cloaking suits with disillusionment charm. A combination of magic and technology. Interesting. He waved his hand, then the ground underneath these stealth soldiers transfigured into metal pikes, impaling them like Swiss cheese. As their bodies fell to the ground, they finally became visible. However, a few seconds after that, Edward's shield trembled slightly and a tiny crack appeared on one side. He frowned as he looked in the direction that the attack came from. At first, he did not see anything, after using the spell Eagle Eye, he saw what was in the distance. Snipers? No, snipers fell under the definition of projectiles, so their attacks should not reach me, let alone damage my shield. Unless these bullets were magically enchanted. Edward's theory was soon proven correct. Many small cracks started appearing on his shield as the soldiers switched to enchanted bullets. Although the cracks would be healed instantly, the soldiers focused all their firepower in one place. C. I have to say that your plan is quite brilliant. Placing ANIT operation enchantments to prevent me from escaping, and having snipers that are out of reach of spells. This tactic is enough to kill the majority if not all wizards in the magical world. Unfortunately for you, I am not just any wizard. He pointed his wand in the sky and activate his Thunderbird bloodline magic. The clouds in the sky gathered together, changing sunny weather into a cloudy one. Thunder flashed into the sky, then a bolt of lightning rushed from the sky and hit one of the snipers, instantly killing him. Following this, more thunderbolts fell from the sky, killing all the snipers in the distance. Many people were awed after seeing this sight, whether it was Edward's followers who were watching this fight no, massacre through divination in a crystal ball, or the soldiers who momentarily forgot to fire their weapons, all of them were shocked. Is this the power of a god, said the commander. No, this is the power of magic, replied Edward. I truly dislike the notion of godhood. Every time humans witness something that they cannot explain or fathom, they often use God as an explanation. To me, Godhood symbolizes ignorance, fear of the unknown, and restriction of the mind. Anyway, if there ever was a God in this world, 
his only fate will be to one day become a subject in my dissecting table. Edward looked in a direction after saying that and sneered. Even since he learned of death's identity, a lot of fears about him were now gone. All right, let's end the charade. Experillamus. A red light flew from his wand and hit the soldiers. Then, all the weapons in their hands flew out, the tanks flip over and landed on their heads. Edward raised his wand on the sky and said, gravity increase. Following this, all the helicopters and jet fighters fell on the ground and exploding. Edward then slowly walked in front of the commander and said, do you have anything else? However, there was no fear on his face. Laughing out loud, the commander said, unfortunately for you, I still have one last card up my sleeve. Edward's danger premonition ability activated and he raised his head to the sky. You actually order a nuclear strike to kill me? Every soldier chosen for this mission was prepared to sacrifice their lives for his mission, and that includes me, replied the commander, with a smirk on his face, it was as if he could taste the sweet flavor of victory. Edward shook his head, then, a flame enveloped him and he instantly appeared one meter from his location. How can you apparate? asked the commander with trembling voice. I never said that I could not apparate. However, you did not need to worry about me running away. After all, my purpose of coming here is to demonstrate to my followers the endless potential of magic. Raising his head to look at the nuke coming his way, Edward said, Do you know why I love magic so much? It's because that it can perfect follows the laws of physics with its restriction and whatnot. Yet, at the same time, it can be completely unreasonable and do unexplainable things. He raised his wand to point at the oncoming missile and said, Materia petrificus. Then, the missile stopped for a brief moment before falling into the floor, breaking into countless pieces. You, you turned it into stone? Neat, isn't it? said Edward with a smile. I've developed this spell especially for a situation like this. After all, even a child knows that the most powerful weapon of mankind is a nuclear bomb. After that, Edward snapped his finger, then the more than 50,000 soldiers along with the commander fell asleep. What should I do with these guys, he muttered to himself. Well, they can be used for the next step of the plan. Underscore 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 underscore. Chapter 107 Challenge In the dimension of the afterlife, Death looked at Edward's battle while thinking about something. Did this wizard figure out about my identity during his travel in the multiverse? This will be a problem. He raised his hand and a golden light appeared in front of him. This amount of faith is enough for me to appear in the material world for one minute. This should be enough time, but the question is, what should I do? I need this wizard's help to activate the ley line nodes again for me to escape. However, he is becoming more and more arrogant and uncontrollable. Should I just kill him and pick someone else? Or better yet, find a way to have someone activate the deathly hallows and allow me to leave a clone in the material world. Death hesitated. The reason being that he was not sure he could kill Edward in one minute. He knew that he could kill him, but the chances of the latter escaping are very high especially with that gate. Death felt that something was different with the gate after returning, so he was not sure whether he could use dimension lock to prevent the new version from escaping. After pondering for a minute, he sighed in frustration and decided to use caution. Damn it. Ever since science became prevalent amongst humans, it has become even more difficult to gather faith. And without mana in the environment, the process is even more arduous. The recent events have made death, no, Herpo very frustrated, it reminded him of the time when he first tried to become a god. After acquiring the death chamber and studying it, Herpo designed specific magic for him to assimilate the power of the chamber and ascend to godhood. However, unlike his counterparts in different timelines, he realized that a massive amount of energy would be required for the process. In his time in ancient Greece, mana still existed in the atmosphere, and it was vast compared to Rowena's timeline. Nevertheless, it was still not enough according to his calculations. So, Herpo decided to go to a period that was enough. After searching the world, he finally discovered the Room of Time. So, after studying it, he developed a method to go back in time where he believed that mana in the environment was at its peak. And that time was exactly 12,000 years ago based on the present time. Unfortunately for Herpo, the process was not as smooth as he envisioned. In the process, he lost his body and most of his soul, with only a small part left intact. Luckily for him, he was a master of the soul, so he managed to swallow an inhabitant of that time and resurrect himself. After regaining his power, he proceeded with his plan, and he succeeded. Well, partially. Because of his ascension, all the mana in the Milky Way galaxy was absorbed, and the ley lines shut themselves off. The other gods of Earth suffered backlash and were forced to revert to the fundamental laws or concepts of the universe. As for the Lemurian magical civilization that existed back then, it was destroyed overnight during that event. The so-called cataclysm that Herpo mentioned to Edward was caused by him. Nevertheless, Herpo was not happy for long. He was soon contacted by something called Cronai which referred to itself as the will of the universe telling him that his magic which allowed a mortal to directly become a god was forbidden and should not exist in the world. And even his existence was forbidden. So, he was punished to remain in the afterlife for all eternity, without being able to leave. Of course, Herpo would not easily accept such a thing. 
He plotted and calculated for thousands of years before discovering a method of escape. First, he slowly influenced the mind of humans to worship him, the god of death. Then, he gathered the faith created by the worship. This is one of the reasons that different civilizations of humans have a concept of the god of death, it was all Herpo's secret manipulation. Unfortunately, the amount of faith needed for Herpo to succeed was truly tremendous. Additionally, with the passage of time and the decrease of mana in the environment, the process became increasingly more difficult. Nevertheless, he still succeeded. By sacrificing most of the faith, he was able to appear in the material plane for a while. So, he created the Deathly Hallow and gave them to the Peveril brothers. The purpose of the Hallows was to turn these brothers into death's puppets or clones that he could control in the material plane. Then, he would start the next step of his escape plan, revive the ley lines. Unfortunately for Herpo, things didn't go as planned. The youngest of the Peveril brothers never trusted death in the first place, so he hid from him. Additionally, Cronai placed a curse on the Hallows to prevent anyone unknowingly accomplishing death's plan. So, all the wizards who searched the Hallows in the hope of becoming the master of death ended up dead, one way or another. Then, Herpo placed his focus on Dumbledore. Using the young headmaster's ambitions, and even later his sister's death, he thought he could lure him to activate the Hallows, but that also failed. Co. And even later on, Harry Potter, the descendant of the youngest Peveril brothers, even destroyed one of the Hallows and made sure that no one could find the other. Finally, Herpo placed his eyes on Edward the outlier of fate, the one that should not exist. At first, he thought that Edward was just a talented wizard that could be seduced to activate the Hallows. Later, Herpo changed his plan after noticing the existence of the gate. He thought that he could slowly lead Edward to directly activate the ley lines for him. Unfortunately, he greatly underestimated the latter's wisdom and ability. Scene break. Edward walked to his aunt's office and saw a bunch of documents in front of her. Amelia raised her head, did you deal with the problem? Yeah. I hunted down all their secret bases and recovered all the missing nuclear submarines. This entire planet is basically under our control for now. So, we are ready for the next phase, replied Amelia, then she handed a document over to him. What's this? The curriculum for all the magic schools in the world according to your requirements. Edward took the document and quickly scanned it. The new curriculum had many things added to them. For example, alchemy was now a required subject for all the schools. This also includes basic muggle science like biology, chemistry, and physics. For the data, students are also required to study dark magic. However, not until they are 14 years old and master the mechanized mind spell. Charm class will be divided into two parts, magic theory and practice. For magic theory, students have to learn basic knowledge about mana and magic core, and even limiters. Although the way to break them is considered high-level knowledge that requires reward points. More importantly, Edward added an honors program to all the schools where magically gifted students can have harder classes and more rigorous schedules. These children in that program will have access to more resources than ordinary children. I don't understand why swordsmanship is a mandatory subject, asked Amelia. I thought you hated any sports-like activity. I remember you once called wizards that fight with melee weapons barbarians. Just because I condemn their practices does not mean that I will not use it. I can tell you I'm a pretty good swordsman, replied Edward, without any shame. As for the reason that it is mandatory, it's to prepare in case of wizards encounter a situation where the power of their magic is useless or ineffective. Without their magic, what can they do with a sword? Recently, I learned from Albion a very crude way of using mana to strengthen the body and granting wizards superhuman strength, speed, and durability. I plan to teach this method in the swordsmanship class. Amelia nodded her head, then asked, well, let's get back to another important topic. After all our plans are done, what will be the title of the empire? What will be your title? Hmm, let's call it the Arcane Empire, and I will be the Arcane Emperor, replied Edward. Great name. Anything else to add? Well, make sure that the law clearly states that as an emperor, I have the right to an imperial harem. As a matter of fact, make polygamy legal. Amelia was momentarily speechless, then she said, whatever you want. Additionally, make it that every 500 years, anyone can challenge me for the throne. If they can prove that they are more powerful and knowledgeable than me, then they can inherit the position of arcane emperor. Amelia frowned before asking, what's the point of doing something like that? To give people hope, replied Edward. Muggles are different from wizards, the idea that everyone is equal has been ingrained in them for many years. So, I can foresee that they will not easily accept being controlled. However, if they have hope that they can slowly climb to the top and become the ones that rule, they will not revolt so easily, they will convince themselves that the person at the top deserved and worked hard for that position. And if he can achieve this level of success, then maybe they can too. Aren't you just giving them false hope, said Amelia. True, but only a few people will realize this, but without the help of the majority, they will be helpless to change anything about it, replied Edward. Plus, it's not necessarily false hope. With all the advantages that I have, if someone can truly beat the odds and become more powerful than me, then I will gladly give him or her the throne. 
so, you want to use this method to always keep you on your toes and not let power go to your head, you can say that. As soon as Edward said these words, an owl came to the window, with a frown, he opened it and took the letter from its feet. After reading it, he smiled. What is it? asked Amelia. A challenge from Dumbledore. Now? No, a month from now. Are you going to accept it? Yes, as this is a perfect opportunity. Recently, I noticed that a group of people in the magical world has taken a neutral stance on my movement. And I know the reason for that is that they are waiting for Dumbledore's action. So, not only will I accept this challenge, but broadcast it to the entire magical world. Chapter 108, Authority. Since Edward still had a month left before the duel, he went about his day as he normally would. He first visited Rowena and made sure that she was healing all right. She had managed to remove the mysterious thing in her soul which both of them have labeled as void energy and transferred her soul to the clone. However, her soul was still in the process of healing. Even with the soul crystals, it will take her a few months to return to a peak state. After that, Edward returned to his laboratory on the moon, he wanted to ask Albion a few questions. After entering a room, he saw the gigantic beast sleeping on a pile of gold. With a sigh, Edward said, Wake up, lazy bum. I have a few questions for you. Opening one eye, then Albion said with a nonchalant tone, You know about our agreement, so pay up first. Meanwhile, Edward was secretly aggrieved after hearing this. Although he could control this dragon to do his bidding, there was still one major restriction, it was the information or knowledge he had in his mind. Every time that he tried to read the dragon's mind, memories, or even searched his soul, a mysterious power from his bloodline would manifest and block his way. Even if Edward ordered him to give him the information, the knowledge will be deleted from the dragon's mind. It was then that he learned that dragons especially noble king bloodline like himself have their one security measure to prevent other beings from getting the dragon's race secrets. And according to Albion, Edward should be proud to even acquire dragon chant magic from him. So, as a last resort, Edward had to make nice with the dragon and develop some sort of friendship or companionship with it. Unfortunately, this dragon is very greedy and would ask things in return every time Edward asked him a question. At first, Albion wanted mana from the Philosopher's Stone, and Edward gave it to him. However, he soon realized that this dragon was growing much larger with each absorption, and becoming more powerful. So, Edward had to control his growth lest he becomes too powerful and out of control. .re.c. So, they came to another compromise. Edward then took out a mountain of gold coins and placed them in the room. Then, he took a few mana crystals and threw them at the dragon who instantly swallowed it. Not as good as the sage stone, but better than regular mana. So, what's your question this time? I want to know about the power of law in this stone, said Edward as he showed the resurrection stone. Power of law? I have to say, wizards, sometimes your intelligence amazed me, and sometimes I want to laugh at your ignorance, replied Albion. Are you saying that this is not the power of law? Laws are the fundamental rules that govern the entire universe. Can you imagine how powerful a person would be if he could control such power? Across the universe, countless powerful civilizations searched for years in hope of acquiring such power, and you think someone in this deserted star system has achieved it? So, what exactly is this power? asked Edward, not remotely embarrassed by his ignorance. He never believed that he knew everything, nor did he believe that he was too mighty to learn from anyone. That's the power of God known as, authority. To be precise, death authority. And what exactly is it? When any being magical or not reaches a certain level of strength, he or she can get in touch with the laws of the universe and receive the permission to use its power. Hence the name, authority. So, authority, is basically fragments of laws. You can say that. By that information, I can guess that Herpo is not the only death god in this universe, but probably countless. That way, it becomes near impossible for one person to control the law, unless he killed all the people with, authority, related to that law. Your thoughts are dangerous, wizards, warned Albion. However, Edward was thinking about something else. Since, authority, comes from the law, and the law is a fundamental part of our universe, what would happen if a god was sent outside of the universe, to the void? Would he lose all his powers, or merely weaken dramatically? Do you know how to acquire the power of, authority, asked Edward. Either another god grants it to you, or by gathering faith from countless people. However, the amount of faith required is tremendous, and no god will easily give part of their, authorities, as that would weaken their strength. However, from my memories, I know that many wizards despise the idea of faith, so they try to find another method to gain access to, authority, but none have succeeded so far. If that's the case, Herpo's probably succeeded. However, there must be some drawbacks, otherwise, his fate would not be so miserable. Could it be that this, faith method, has some problem, asked Edward. Yes. What are they? I think I've said too much for today, don't you? That's true, replied Edward. Then, he took out a few more mana crystals and gave them to him. After that, he left. Albion looked at Edward's departed back and thought to himself. Many wizards had the same plan as him to search for different worlds to strengthen themselves, but none have survived. So, will this guy be any different, or will he create a miracle? I'm looking forward to it.
Then, he went back to sleep. Meanwhile, after leaving, Edward began to prepare for his battle with Dumbledore. He set up large televisions around the world, then had them magically enchanted with divination charms to broadcast the battle. At first, he wanted to use technology, but knowing how crazy this battle might be, no camera could probably survive. Unfortunately, there were currently only seven people who could use divination in the magical world. Including Edward who could only use the most basic spell they were, Nicholas Flamel, Professor Trelawney who received a potion that strengthened her bloodline, two African wizards, and one very special centaur. The last one was Luna Lovegood who was also identified as having a powerful hidden bloodline. Unfortunately, she was too young to help. So, with the help of these six people, everything was set up in one month. On the fateful day of the battle, all the wizards in the world gathered to witness this battle that many were already calling the Battle of the Century. Edward Operat to the location of the duel. He then took a quick look around. The entire small island was deserted, and a forest was not far from them. He looked at the headmaster and immediately realized that he looked much younger and energetic, his eyes were practically glowing. I had a feeling that this battle would not be so simple, said Edward. You managed to break the other two limiters in such a short time. I wondered how you did it. Chapter 109 Battle of the Century, I. I've had help from a few old friends, replied Dumbledore calmly. Edward then looked at the wand in the headmaster's hand as he guessed that he might have used Grindelwald's method of using the, death authority, to break one of the limiters. As for the other one, he might have used Fox or something else. Edward would not be surprised if Grindelwald revealed the way he used to break the limiter to Dumbledore. Even if the latter has chosen his side, he won't entirely become loyal until he defeated Dumbledore. I hoped you would see things my way, said Edward. I thought about it, but in the end, I could not agree with your ideas despite all the positive change that you will bring to the magical world. One person should not have so much power. So, it comes down to the old saying that absolute power corrupts absolutely. I'm not going to say that I'm incorruptible, but that alone is not enough to stop me. As long as I surround myself with people that can keep me in check, that's good enough for me. But would those people be able to stop you? Asked Dumbledore back. Aren't you the one who always told me to have more faith in people? Things are not that simple, replied Dumbledore. One day you will have the power to decide the fate of everybody on this planet. If something goes wrong with you, do you expect faith to be able to stop you? That same logic can be applied to any talented and powerful wizard throughout history including you and yet the world is still fine. Like I've told you many times, not everyone will turn into Voldemort. You of all people should understand that your potential is not something either me or Voldemort could fathom. So, the threat you can possibly pose to the world is nothing comparable. Is that so, replied Edward calmly. How about we see what the world would look like without me? He placed his wand on his temple to retrieve a memory, waved it in the air and a scene showed up, it was the Harry Potter movie. As such for the next twelve hours and such, the entire magical world looked at what the world would look like without Edward. They watched the adventures of the Gryffindor trio in confronting the obstacles in the first movie, their Harry Potter adventures in the Chamber of Secrets, Sirius's escape from Azkaban, and the eventual reveal of Peter Pettigrew as a traitor. They saw the Triwizard Tournament of next year, the death of Cedric Diggory, the resurrection of Voldemort, the gathering of the Death Eaters, the fall of the Ministry of Magic, Dumbledore's death, the oppressing regime of Voldemort, the trio's quest to destroy the Horcrux, and the final battle of Hogwarts where many students die. Many people had different reactions to different parts. Hermione was embarrassed at the fact that she actually ended up with Ron. The Weasley family was shocked at the fact one of their sons was almost turned into a werewolf, while another died. Fred was quite surprised by his death, while George could not fathom a world without his brother. Both Lupin and Sirius raised an eyebrow after seeing their death. Amelia hugged little Susan after seeing her death and sighed, meanwhile Susan's parents hugged them together. Another person hugging his children was Amos Diggory, he could not imagine his proud son dying just like that. He wished he could kill Peter Pettigrew if he was not already executed. Lupin and Tonks who were all watching these duels in a private room with all the members of the Order of Phoenix looked at one another and blushed slightly. Something might be brewing between these two. The Malfoys gritted their teeth after seeing the psychological torture their son suffered at the hands of Voldemort. Neville Longbottom's grandmother looked at how her grandson slowly turned into a real Gryffindor, and she was very proud of him. For the first time in a while, she gave him some praise. As for his parents, they were happy that they did not have to spend the rest of their lives in St. Mungo's Hospital. Lily Potter looked at Snape next to her, and she secretly sighed, she finally understood the extent of Snape's love for her, and the things he was willing to do because of that love.fen.c. For a brief moment, she was confused about what to do. However, after gazing at Harry, she internally sighed and steeled her resolve. As for Harry Potter, he thought his future self was cool with all the adventures he got to experience with his two best friends. However, thinking that he could never see his mother again, and lose many people close to him, he did not want to live in that world. Tell me, what do you think of this future? asked Edward. After Voldemort's fall, the ministry was rebuilt and many of the old laws made by blood supremacists were eradicated by Kingsley Shacklebolt. 
however, the situation of the wizard did not change much, we were still hiding in a corner of the world. Meanwhile, Muggle society developed rapidly. Edward waved his wand again, showing an image of his past life of the year 2019. With the invention of the internet and smartphone, muggles can communicate with anyone across the globe with a push of a button. On top of that, once the social media age arrived, everyone was constantly sharing everything with millions of strangers online. RWL.OM. Now, in this world, how do you think wizards survive? With cameras everywhere, as long as someone used the slightest bit of magic, it will be captured and shared with billions of people across the globe. As long as one parent records their children awakening their magical abilities, this knowledge will also be known to the world. Many magical animals would find it very difficult to hide, and most likely be hunted down for sports or to be dissected. Tell me, how long do you think wizards would be able to hide? I can tell you that muggles will develop all these technologies by 2010, so there are about 20 years left. Do you still think that what I'm doing is wrong? Dumbledore sighed and asked. Since when have you had such a prophecy? You can say since I was six years old. Is that relevant? No, but I can finally understand some things about you, replied Dumbledore. Nevertheless, this will not change anything. You are heading to a path where you will become an immortal ruler of an empire that spreads across the universe, across dimensions and worlds. No matter how I look at it, this story does not end well for the magical world. You may bring a brief period of peace and prosperity, but eventually, your pursuit of knowledge will end in disaster for everyone. So, you want to stop a bright future because of the slight possibility of failure, replied Edward. Slight? Could you say with the utmost truth that you will never conduct experiments that could possibly destroy our entire civilization? I cannot promise that. In my pursuit of the truth, I'm willing to risk my life, so should all wizards who follow me. You do not get to decide that, retorted Dumbledore. And you get to decide whether the magical world gets to experience years of prosperity on the basis that one day I might become corrupt, said Edward, who then sighed. It's obvious that we are two stubborn men who refuse to yield for their beliefs. In that case, let's end this war of words and let our wand decide the fate of the magical world. So, the two raised their wands to begin this battle. Chapter 110, Battle of the Century, 2. Both Edward and Dumbledore raised their wands at each other, and light came out of their wands to clash in the middle. The light from Edward's wand was blue, while the one from the headmaster was yellow. Sparks flew where the light met, creating a burst of wind that blew away all the dirt in the ground. This confrontation only lasted for a few seconds before the two stopped at the same time. In this brief test, they gauged the mana of their opponents and realized that they were somewhat evenly matched. So, the real battle finally began. Edward waved his wand to create more than twenty ice spears in the air, which then rushed towards the headmaster. Not being outdone, Dumbledore created twenty spears of his one, but the flame elements. A massive exploding occurred after the spears clashed, creating a large amount of steam in the surrounding, obscuring the views of the two. Instantly, Edward activated an X-ray vision spell to locate Dumbledore, he waved his wand to control the steam in the environment to rush towards his opponent. En. O. However, the headmaster was prepared as a shield appeared in front of him blocking the burning stem. However, he also knew that his shield would not last long, so he waved his wand upward, creating an earth wall in front of him, blocking the attack. E. C. M. Without pausing, a light flew from Edward, and after hitting the wall, it slowly turned into mud, rendering it useless. Nevertheless, the headmaster had bought himself enough time. A vast amount of water was summoned from his wand, turning his surrounding into a river. Then, under his control, a tsunami large enough to destroy a city rushed toward Edward, wanting to swallow him whole. With a wave of his wand, a gigantic earth wall also appeared in front of him, the wall as high as a skyscraper. So, when the tsunami hit it, the water was separated into two and did not even touch Edward. Seeing that his attack failed, Dumbledore prepared for his next move. However, the earth wall suddenly turned into metal, and a spark of electricity flashed from it. In just a split second, a large amount of lightning traveled from the wall through the water, heading towards Dumbledore. Without having much time to react, he instantly operated away from his original position. Unfortunately for him, as soon as he appeared in his new spot, a pillar made of lightning rushed from the water towards him. Without much options, he once again operated away. However, no matter where appeared, a pillar of lightning will instantly rise from the water. Is this the reason that he did not place anti-apparition charm in the surrounding? Because he can predict where I'm going to appear? With his mind running quickly, Dumbledore operated again, however, he instantly placed a shield around. The pillar of lightning pushed him upward, but he still resided it for a while, then taking the opportunity, he waved his wand, instantly freezing all the water and stopping the lightning. Dumbledore's breath was heavy after stopping this attack. Nevertheless, he still did not have the time to rest. He saw Edward create a giant hammer from the ice in the surroundings. Pointing his wand at it, a massive tornado appeared and blew the ice hammer away. It crashed on a forest on this island, creating a massive crater. Additionally, many trees instantly turned into ice afterward. Dumbledore's tornado did not stop there but rushed towards Edward with the utmost momentum. Not only was it powerful, but it was also very fast. 
With no choice, Edward erected a barrier around him, yet, he has still pushed away a few dozen meters. On top of that, he could feel the tornado slowly grinding his shield. So, he tried to apparate away, however, the headmaster blocked the surrounding space, Edward could feel that even the house elf magic was also blocked. Fortunately, he still had the phoenix's ability. Turning into a flame, he appeared away from the center of the tornado. However, no long after he appeared in his new location, the tornado followed him under the control of Dumbledore. So, Edward pointed at it and created a large tornado of his own. The island trembled after the two tornadoes clashed, creating massive winds. Trees were instantly uplifted from their roots and flew away. Fortunately, this was an inhibited island, otherwise, the people there would also be flown away. As for the two of them, they were intact during the confrontation, with shields surrounding them. Edward used the power of gravity to remain in place and not be blown away, while Dumbledore used earth magic to glue himself to the ground. While his wand was still creating a tornado to clash with the headmaster, he raised to make a clenching motion. Suddenly, Dumbledore felt a tremendous weight around him and his shield. Cracks started appearing on the floor he was standing on. Identifying this power as gravity, he raised his hand and powerful force came out from his body to resist. Telekinesis, thought Edward. He was not surprised that the headmaster could use telekinesis as even young wizards could control things with their minds. He even saw Grindelwald who was camouflaging as Percival Graves flip an entire car with a wave of his hand, and he could do the same. He was slightly surprised at how Dumbledore could use it to block his gravity magic. Nevertheless, he focused soon focused on this battle. He waved his wand upward, forcing the two clashing tornadoes to fly upward, then with his left hand, increased the gravity on the headmaster, he tapped his wand on the air, then the space trembled. Dumbledore's eyes widened for a moment. He saw the space around broke apart into many space circles. Then, spear appeared from them, these spears were of different elements, flame, ice, thunder, etc. The headmaster immediately wanted to apparate, but the space around him was also blocked, he secretly sighed as he realized Edward's deep understanding of space magic on top of elemental magic. However, it did not take him long to realize the reason. From his interview with him a few years ago, Dumbledore believed that Edward was trying to travel to other dimensions on his own. So, his research on space magic is probably very deep. Dumbledore knew that this time he was in deep trouble. With the power of gravity restraining him and the inability to apparate, he did not believe his shield could stop all these elemental spears. Nevertheless, he still remained calm. As soon as those spears rushed towards him, the frozen ice under his feet opened up and Dumbledore buried himself a few hundred feet beneath the earth. However, he still felt the tremor of that previous attack. Following this, he created a tunnel to appear above ground a few meters from his original location. Dumbledore looked solemnly at Edward, knowing that his current tactic was not working. He waved his wand to control the ice in the surroundings into ten giant soldiers wearing full-body armor and holding weapons. Transfiguration, muttered Edward to himself. Chapter 111 Battle of the Century, 3 After seeing that the headmaster switched to using transfiguration magic, he secretly shook his head. According to his understanding of magic, there are two kinds of ways to study or improve transfiguration, to be precise, two kinds of transfiguration wizards. The first one is the natural gifted at the subject. With the right incantation, the proper control of mana, they can use their thoughts or imagination to accomplish the right transformation. The headmaster and Professor McGonagall are in this category. The second type is the one that studies different materials and their properties in great detail, then they can achieve the proper transfiguration. The more knowledge they have about their intended target, the better the transfiguration. The majority of wizards fell in that category. As for Edward, he falls under both. His natural gift for magic also applied to transfiguration. Additionally, he has dissected so many magical animals at this point that he can understand them to the cellular level. So, his transfiguration especially the biological one is quite powerful. With a wave of his wand, the few remaining ice and debris slowly transformed into five wyverns and five thunderbirds. Under Edward's command, the Welsh green dragons started attacking the giants created by Dumbledore. They tried to bite them with their powerful jaws, but the armor on the giants was not just decorations. After their attacks were proven futile, the wyverns started using fire breath. On top of that, the thunderbirds flew into the sky, creating thunderstorms that covered the entire island. Heavy rain started to fall, followed by powerful gusts of winds, lightning fell from the sky attacking all the giants. Although Dumbledore quickly placed a shield on them, some of them were still hit. Fortunately, these giants seemed to have powerful magic resistance just like real giants. A light flew Dumbledore's wand to hit of one the giants, and suddenly, his body grew by another 10 meters, reaching the height of 80 meters. He then raised the shield he was holding to the sky. The shield then expanded until it covered all the other giants, and protected them from the thunder. Instantly, the situation changed. Without the help of the Thunderbirds, the Wyverns were at a disadvantage even with their flying ability. The giants used their weapons to smash, cut, or stab them. Blood spilled as the island trembled with each swing. Fire raged and burned everything in sight including some armors of the giants. 
Upon seeing the situation, Edward acted. He transformed a few stones on the ground into armors fit for wyvern, then he placed a few instant enchantments on them. Noel.cm. And with another wave of his wand, these armors perfectly fitted the wyverns. Immediately, they felt their strength, agility, defense, and stamina dramatically increase. Thus, with newfound power, they attacked the giants with more ferocity. Dumbledore frowned for a moment, then controlled a few tree branches around him. To Edward's surprise, they turned into an army of status holding modern weapons like guns. There were even a few tanks, along with planes flying in the sky. However, he also quickly realized that the technology was actually based on World War II. Is he recreating a scene he saw during World War II, though Edward after seeing this? Then, he also controlled the stones and debris surrounding him to turn into an army, recreating the events he experienced a month ago. However, his army was also not made of humans or status, but golems or robots. They held guns, bazookas, drove tanks, helicopters, and fighter jets. After Edward made his move, the battlefield turned chaotic. A modern army was fighting one from World War II, ten giants clad in armors were fighting five wyverns, while a bunch of thunderbirds messed up the weather. All the wizards watching this battle were shocked they felt that this was a battle between two gods. No one expected that wizards could actually become so powerful. Some of the former squibs who used to live in muggle society imagined what it would be like if those two actually fought in a place full of people, they discovered that individually, they could destroy a city of their own, not to mention clashing together. Inside the Black family house, the Order of the Phoenix had a private viewing of the battle after asking Trelawney to set it up for them. I feel that something is wrong, but I cannot say what it is, said Tonks who was brought to this place as a possible future member of the Order. Unfortunately, she did not have the opportunity to officially join as Dumbledore basically disbanded the group and went to fight Edward alone as the headmaster did not want to make his colleague do something that they did not want to. After she said these words, many people agreed with her, they were all by the power displayed by these people, but they also felt that something was wrong with this battle. Of course, something is wrong, replied Alastair Moody, drawing everyone's attention to himself. It's not a secret that Edward is a master of the dark arts, and from the information I gather, the so-called arcane grand library that he has been preaching about to everyone contains some truly powerful and lost dark magic. Yet, he has no use a single dark magic spell throughout the entire battle. Immediately, the other members realized the issue, Alastair was correct. A lot of them knew Dumbledore quite well, thus knew that the headmaster refused to use dark magic in his life, and he will probably not do so in this battle. Additionally, among all these people, only Lily has seen Edward's library, or as Alastair said, the arcane grand library. She saw the section on dark magic and knew how large it was. Why is he doing this? asked Tonks back, a question many others were also asking. To show the world that he can defeat the greatest white wizard using only white magic. That way, no nun can complain about the outcome of the battle, replied Alastair. If he wins in that way, his prestige will reach the highest level possible, and all the people who still remained neutral will have no choice but to support him including some of us in the room. The room became quiet after Mad-Eye said these words as he was right. Many members of the Order supported Edward's idea of integrating with the non-magical to build a better and more powerful civilization. Some people remained neutral, deciding to wait for Dumbledore's next move. However, once the battle is over, they will have two choices, pick a side, or remain secluded from society for the rest of their lives. Back to the battle. In just a few minutes, the battle reached a different height. Dumbledore's World War II army had no chance against Edward's more modern army, while the giants were slowly losing the battle. Even the one who covered the sky with his shield was destroyed by the constant bombardment of thunder. Upon seeing this, Dumbledore pointed his wand and massive light gathered before rushing into the middle of the battlefield. After landing, it soon expanded until it covered everything, then Edward's transfiguration turned into their original shapes of stones, ice, and debris. Untransfiguration, thought Edward after seeing this. This was a type of magic that revert transfiguration spells to their original state. With a snap of his finger, a magical wave emanated from Edward's body, also turning Dumbledore's transfiguration back to its original state. The headmaster was not surprised. With a calm look, he said, I did not want things to go this far, but I have to do this, for the greater good. Suddenly, Fox appeared next to him, then the two fused together. Flaming wings appeared behind Dumbledore, he turned into a middle-aged version of himself, he had a crown made of feathers, and a robe made of flame. However, this was not what caught Edward's attention, it was what happened next. Dumbledore's mana level suddenly raised beyond the 100x threshold, reaching another level. He then pointed the Elder Wand at Edward, and powerful dark energy suddenly manifested from it. And Edward immediately realized what it was, death authority. Immediately, for the first time since the battle, he felt the threat of death. A massive dark light energy beam with the power to instantly annihilate everything rushed from the wand headed straight to Edward, without giving him any room to dodge or evade. Chapter 112 Battle of the Century Finale after the dark light beam disappeared, everything in its path was annihilated. All the mountains and forests behind Edward completely vanished. 
As for him, he was in terrible shape. Half of his body was completely gone, his clothes were tattered. What's weird was that there was no blood coming from the remaining half of his body. Instead, there was dark energy located in that spot that was slowly corroding him. Edward looked at his body and sighed, it has been a long time since he was in true danger of death. If he did not use a space spell at the last minute that allowed him to bend the surrounding space to form a shield around him, he would have been completely gone. Edward then looked at the broken wand in his hand and sighed again. He had this wand from Ollivander since he was eleven years old. Although he could make a more powerful one, he never replaced it because of the memory of his parents taking him there to get it. But now, it was broken. Using a reverse summoning spell, the broken wand was sent to another location. Then, Edward focused on his injury. Immediately, he felt a force in his body that was slowly destroying it, and also prevented healing. So, without hesitation, he waved his hand and cut another big piece of his body, to be precise, the pieces that still had the corrosive force. Then, Edward burst into flame, and a few seconds later, a complete body appeared wearing clothes made out of flames as well. He then raised his head, wondering why the headmaster gave him so much time to heal. Instantly, he noticed that Dumbledore's breathing was heavy, and sweats all over his forehead. With difficulty, he raised his arm to point his wand, and another dark beam started to form again. Without the slightest hesitation, Edward flew into the sky, trying to use his mobility to evade. His plan partially worked as he evaded the dark beam, but Dumbledore flapped his phoenix wings to fly into the sky to follow him. As he did so, he continued to shoot devastatingly powerful dark beams. At first, Edward was able to evade them, but the process became continuously more difficult. So, he went on the defensive. He raised his hand in the sky, then more than a hundred spherical rocks appeared. Then, these rocks turned into flames. Then, he used gravity to accelerate these rocks as they rushed toward Dumbledore like meteors. Unfortunately, once these rocks reached 10 meters from the headmaster, the flames went out, and the rocks turned gray before disintegrating into countless tiny particles. They decayed, thought Edward, realizing that he was truly in some trouble. That last attack was one of his most powerful spells created from dragon chant magic. Should I use the stone? Or dark magic? thought Edward. Not yet. This battle is a perfect way for me to calm down all dissonance voices amongst my followers. So, unless necessary, I won't use these things. So, I can only use that method. Nevertheless, my mana is at all high time low after using that last space barrier spell. Plus, I will need a lot of mana if I want to use that spell to defeat him. Dumbledore pointed the Elder Wand at Edward again, but this time, a beam did not appear. Instead, a mysterious suction came from it.fee.m. Immediately, Edward felt that something was being forcefully pulled out from his body, it was his soul. With great horror, he instantly activated the enchantment he engraved in his soul, creating a soul barrier. Unfortunately, that only reduced the effect of the attraction and bought him so time to react. Albion, roared Edward as he used a summoning spell. Cracks appeared in the space around, then a giant beast with four legs and a massive wingspan appeared, he had horns and was golden in color. Everyone wizard watching this godlike battle was shocked after seeing this including Dumbledore. Meanwhile, the Gryffindor trio along with the excited Hagrid immediately realized that this was the real dragon that Edward told them about. Hagrid was so excited that he wanted to run to this island to see this cute creature and become friends with it. Human wizard, why have you disturbed my slumber? This is not the time for you to be acting up. Look at the situation, responded Edward with gritted teeth. Albion then finally noticed Dumbledore. A lesser phoenix with bloodline really close to a real one, muttered Albion. Wait, this wizard managed to activate the, authority, in the wand. While the dragon was talking, Edward placed his hand on him and fused with him just like Dumbledore and Fox. However, unlike the first fusion, wings did not appear on his back, nor scale or claws. After all, he was being watched by so many people, he had a reputation to uphold. Unfortunately, his transformation was not as cool as Dumbledore's. The only change that occurred was that his eyes turned reptilian-like. After the fusion, Edward's mana was refilled, and with his connection with Albion's soul, he was able to prevent his own soul from being sucked. I have to say, wizards on this planet are truly weird. Space magic is usually something that only powerful mages can use, but children 17 years of age can do so on this planet. On top of that, you guys created a sage stone, something that many alchemists have spent countless millennia studying to no avail. Then, you guys have time artifacts, artifacts to increase intelligence, and even created magic similar to a lich's phylactery. Now, there is another wizard that activated a, authority, with his meager amount of mana. What the hell is wrong with this planet that looked so weak and backward on the surface? Do you think that this is the time for this? asked Edward, who noticed the headmaster's next attack. This time, it was not a beam, but a black sphere that was rapidly gathered. The sphere then rushed towards Edward, who evaded it. However, the sphere seemed to have the ability to follow him, so wherever he went, it followed. Without much choice, he tried to teleport, but the space was blocked by Dumbledore. Even his phoenix teleportation was not possible. Nevertheless, he still had another way. 
by using a large amount of mana, he forcibly opened the blockade and teleported away from the sphere. Of course, the black sphere followed him, but he still bought himself enough time for his next spell. Wyvern Summon Just like Albion, countless lesser dragons or wyvern appeared around Edwards, there were Chinese fireballs, Norwegian ridgebacks, Hungarian horntails, etc. All the different types of dragons appeared, thus making the sky full of flying dragons. And these dragons came out of nowhere, but from Edward's farm, and from wild areas where they were located. As soon as the wyverns appeared, they formed a circle around Edward, then a powerful shield appeared around them. Then, the shield connected into a larger and more powerful one. Once the black sphere hit the shield, it was stopped before exploding. Nevertheless, the attack was still blocked a fact which greatly relived Edward. Meanwhile, Dumbledore frowned after seeing this, then his eyes flashed ruthlessly. He suddenly aged and returned to his old man's self, then he pointed his wand again. A black sphere slowly started to gather, and in just a few seconds, grew bigger than the previous one. After seeing this, Edward hurried to make his next move. He started to chant. In nomine mio, tanquam minister magici, precipio tibi ut mea mandata audias. Omnis spatii potentia turbobiter vel impotens. As he said those words, they appeared in golden letters written in the air. His mana rapidly decreased. This was a new form of magic that he created that relied on long incantation, it was based on alchemy enchantments and dragon chant magic. Although this kind of magic was powerful, the downside was that it requires a lot of mana, and it took time. By the time that Edward finished his long incantation, Dumbledore's death sphere also finished gathering and headed for the shield created by all the wyverns. As for Edward, the golden letters in the air shined brightly, then the space around started to tremble. Cracks started appearing around Dumbledore, then an explosion occurred. Space exploded, leaving turbulent energy in the surroundings. The death sphere was instantly teleported to somewhere unknown. The remaining half of the island was destroyed. As for the people watching this battle, they only felt everything shake, then the divination magic stopped working, they could no longer see the fight. So, everybody started to wonder who was the victor. Meanwhile, as soon as Edward finished the spell, he fell from the air as his mana was dry. Luckily for him, Albion stopped the fusion and caught him before he fell in the ocean. While breathing heavily, he said out loud, Momo. His house elf suddenly appeared next to him, floating in the next, she did not dare to stand on Albion's back. Momo then threw a bag to Edward. He took out a few potions from them to drink, replenish some level of mana. Immediately afterward, he used a spell to detect any life around him, and soon he found something. He found Dumbledore's body, lying on the ocean. Only his torso was left intact, and he should be dead by now. However, a white flame seemed to be keeping him alive. With a wave of his hand, he took the headmaster's body and had Albion fly away. Underscore 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 underscore. Chapter 113 Public Reveal Edward took Dumbledore's body to an isolated castle. Using his own phoenix flame, he regenerated the lost limbs of the headmaster, then fed him some elixir of life to extend his overdraft life force. A few minutes later, Dumbledore opened his eyes, he looked around before muttering, I'm not dead? No, replied Edward. Fox used some kind of sacrificial magic to save your life. So, he's gone? Leaving me all alone. I've managed to gather a small piece of his soul. With the right method and enough time, he might be revived. Although, the chances of that are quite low. Dumbledore nodded his head in thanks, but he did not say anything else. Edward took out a contract before saying, I need you to agree to the terms in this contract. Without saying anything, Dumbledore just nodded his head in agreement and placed his hand on the contact, signing it. Then, countless gray strings came out from his temple, and Edward placed them into an orb. Edward quickly scanned the memories as he wanted to know the answer to certain things, and he did find the answer. For example, how did Dumbledore manage to break all his limiters and increase his mana so quickly? The answer to the first question was as he theorized. Dumbledore used his bloodline bond with Fox to break the second limiter, then asked Grindelwald's help to break the last one using the Elder Wand. As for the increase of mana, the answer was actually quite simple, it was from his body. As wizards grow older, the mana inside their bodies keeps increasing. If they do not break the limiters, the mana is then scattered through their bodies without any use besides nourishing the body and prolonging life. What Dumbledore did was to gather this mana from his body and guide them to his magic core. And with his talent and more than 100 years of growth, it was more than enough to reach the level of 100x. However, Edward did notice something odd. During the process of breaking the third limiter, Dumbledore heard a whisper. From the memory, Dumbledore only thought that he was hearing things since he was a little on edge, but Edward knew it was not so as he recognized that voice, death, or herpo. Soon after that whisper, Dumbledore became a little obsessed with finding a way to activate the, authority, in the wand and to stop Edward at all cost. I was right to be cautious. Although herpo cannot leave the afterlife, he can still influence the material world in some shape or form. Edward then looked at Dumbledore before sending him a bunch of memories. A slight surprise flashed from his eyes, followed by a somber look. Do you understand the real enemy now? 
Dumbledore did not answer him but looked around with his eyes. You do not need to worry about his gaze. This castle was built personally by me with a magic metal called Magicium, it can effectively block him from spying here. I'm sorry about my actions, said the former headmaster. There is no need for apologies, but there is something you can do for me. Dumbledore paused for a few minutes, what is it? Then, Edward explained to him what he needed to do, and he accepted. You should get comfortable in this castle as from now on, to the outside world, you're a dead man, added Edward. Although I can allow you to say goodbye to your friends, they will have to keep a secret. After that, Edward took the Elder Wand and Operat away, this time, he appeared to Nurmengard Castle to see Grindelwald. As soon as he entered the cell, he saw the old man smiling, and waiting for him. Edward threw something at him and said, sign it. Without hesitation, he did so. For him, he did not care that he would sign his soul away. As long as he can see wizards free from their current situation, then he can pay any price. Anyway, his dream will finally be accomplished. After he signed the contract, Edward handed him a potion. Soon after drinking it, Grindelwald turned into a middle-aged man, then for the first time in decades, he left the castle, his prison. After giving Grindelwald something to do, Edward returned to his Aunt Amelia's house. Thank Merlin you're alright. I thought you perished with Dumbledore. Many of your followers are starting to freak out, said Amelia. Don't worry, I'm fine, just a little tired. As for my followers, I will address the situation. Amelia nodded her head, what about Dumbledore? He's still alive. You did not kill him? Why, ronuel.m. Edward paused for a moment, then he answered, he was partially right. In case something happens to me whether that I was mind-controlling, corroded by some force, or let power get to my head I need a failsafe to stop him, he's part of that failsafe. Aren't you being a little too paranoid? I have recently learned that no matter how cautious I think I am, it is not enough. So, it is better to be safe than sorry. After that, Edward used divination magic once again to address all the previous spectators of the duel, showing them that he was the winner of this match. Furthermore, he did not vilify the headmaster for his actions but stated that it was merely the result of different ideas or philosophies for the future of wizard kind. And, he also stated that Dumbledore will forever be remembered as one of the greatest wizards that ever lived, forever engraved in history. After this battle, Edward's status as the leader of the entire magical world was set in stone. People started addressing him as Lord, Your Majesty, and even Wizard King. Additionally, with the way that he handled Dumbledore's affair, the neutral groups among wizards finally acknowledged his status as the leader and followed him. For the next year, he spent most if not all of his time securing his power and uniting all the wizards from different countries, placing them under one body of law. More importantly, he created the Bones Advanced School of Magic, which was basically a university for wizards after they finished their seven years in school where they can learn advanced knowledge. Of course, it was not only young wizards that have just graduated that were allowed to attend. Any adult wizard of any age could attend this school. Plus, Edward created a specific program in this school where they can graduate in just three months. In this program, wizards will have access to a diadem, then have knowledge forcibly installed in their heads just like Bellatrix and the Death Eaters did. This way, they can learn years of knowledge in just a few months, with the cost of constant migraines. Of course, wizards with weak wills cannot survive these methods. Then, in the summer of 1994, another major event occurred. Not only in the magical world but the entire planet. The UN suddenly asked all the countries in the world to gather together to broadcast important news. Oddly enough, everybody complied. All TV stations were prepared to broadcast the same thing. Large televisions were established in public areas, gathering large crowds to watch this announcement. When the time arrived, Edward's face showed up on all these screens, but he was not alone. Albion was sleeping behind him. So, to the horror of close 7 billion humans on this planet, they saw a man standing in front of a dragon on their television. At first, some people thought that this was some kind of movie effect, but when they realized that no movie could have such a vivid effect and the fact that this was actually a live event. Dressed in a black suit, and with a smile on his face, Edward started speaking, Greetings, citizens of Earths. As he said those words, they were translated into different languages. My name is Edward Bones, the current leader of the magical world. Now, I'm sure many of you are somewhat confused, so I will explain. Amongst many humans on this planet, there exist a few individuals born with the extraordinary gift of magic, they are collectively called wizards. After saying that, he paused for a moment, raised his hand. Then, flame, lightning, ice, wind manifested one another in his palm. As you can, this group of individuals can do many mysterious and magical things. Unfortunately, due to the low number of our kind and the persecution we endured during the Middle Age, we decided to hide from society. That isolation lasted for more than a millennia. And during that time, we never interfered with the affairs of the non-magical world. Since we are a peaceful people by nature, we believe that this was the best course of action. Unfortunately, our peaceful life was destroyed not long ago. A group of individuals from the non-magical world attacked us, killing many of our children and women. After Edward said that, the camera shifted to the soldiers who were part of the anti-wizard alliance. 
The viewers soon noticed that these soldiers were from different races, countries, and ethnicities. Following this, a short clip was shown of these men killing children and women, with no remorse whatsoever. Although we managed to apprehend these individuals, the magical world has realized that our seclusive approach may not be the best approach for our kind, that even we are peaceful by nature, it did not mean that our neighbor was, we realized that we needed change. So, I'm speaking to you today, not out of hatred, nor for a declaration of war. No, I'm speaking to all of you today, to ask for your help. I'm asking you to help our kind integrate into society so that such a tragedy no longer happens. I'm asking you to work together with us, and build a better world for both the magical and non-magical. Chapter 114 Time Skip After the reveal of wizards to the world, everything changed. Wizards started to live with muggles and showed themselves to the world. Under Edward's control, they integrate into society by helping. Videos of them using magic to help people build infrastructure, curing incurable diseases, and increasing farming productivity was shown all over the world, creating a positive image for all wizards. Additionally, in that same year, the Triwizard Tournament was supposed to take place. Edward instead organized a tournament for all the 11 magical schools of the world, then broadcast for everyone both wizard and muggles to see. In this tournament, Edward did not place an age restriction, so everyone could participate. In the end, Hermione was chosen for Hogwarts, and she ended up winning the entire competition, granting her worldwide fame. In the summer of 1995, after the tournament, Arthur Weasley created the first MageTech product, a monster dueling disc that functioned with mana crystals. With this invention, the non-magical could play Yu-Gi-Oh card. In January 1996, a worldwide dueling monster competition was held, with both Muggle and Wizards participating. The success of this event further strengthens the integration between the magical and non-magical world. In that same month, the sport of Quidditch was officially introduced to Muggles. Arthur Weasley invented another mage tech invention, a flying broom. The broom was powered by mana crystal and was enchanted with a mind-controlling charm which allowed ordinary people to control the broom with their minds, just like any wizard. After the mana flying broom was invented, Quidditch became a mainstream sport amongst ordinary people. It was played in schools, official sports teams were created based on different regions or countries just like soccer. And when it came to the Quidditch World Cup, players were chosen based on the skills of both wizards and normal people. In November of 1996, an event that was out of Edward's control occurred. The Pope who was supposed to be under control somehow managed to break free and went on live air, denouncing wizards as pawns of the devil. As a result of this, many religious believers around started to protest, and the peaceful integration of these two worlds reached a stumbling block. After a quick investigation, Edward quickly found a group of people that did not really surrender, but bid their time, these people were even willing to suffer the backlash of soul contracts to accomplish their goals. After the Pope's announcement, tension began to rise between the magical and non-magical. Jealousies that were buried deep started to resurface. Edward and Amelia quickly took control of the media to change the narrative. News like, if Jesus Christ was real, then he was probably a wizard started circulating 24-7 all over the world. FVL.O. Videos of wizards and even children doing miracles like walking on water, changing water into wine, and healing the blind, etc., appeared all over the media. Free EVL. And he did not stop there, he began to wage a war of words on religion. All the inaccuracies found in the Bible were broadcast to the world. For example, the fact that the picture of Jesus Christ that most Christians worshipped was in fact, Cesare Borgia. The fact that, logically speaking, he was a Jewish man born in the Middle Eastern, there was no way for him to be a white man. And they did not stop there. They broadcasted all the dirty secrets that religious leaders have hidden for centuries. Edward did not want any religion interfering with his rule, but he also knew that it was impossible to get rid of it, and straight up outlawing it would lead to constant revolt. So, he made sure to reduce their presence and power to the lowest level possible. In the future, any kind of religion can only be used as a form of spiritual relief for people, nothing more, nothing less. After this event, the world became peaceful and quiet for some time. Wizards naturally integrated into society. Magic and technology increased at a rapid pace beyond anyone could imagine. Then, in 1998, another major event occurred. Space cracks appeared all over the world. Then, an interdimensional race known as Dementors invaded planet Earth. These creatures that looked like the embodiment of death used humans as their food and sucked their souls out of their bodies, in just a short amount of time, they spread terror throughout the entire world. Different countries tried to fight the threat, but modern weapons proved to be useless. Even a nuke could not kill these intangible creatures. If it was not for mage tech, people might not even be able to see them after their first grand entrance to this planet where they intentionally revealed themselves. Luckily for the citizens of Earth, wizards have heard of Dementors before and have developed some magical spells that could still fight these creatures. So, wizards became the main fighting force against this invasion. Unfortunately, issues of diplomacy made traveling to other countries very difficult, meaning it was hard for some wizards to respond quickly. 
So, the UN decided to form the Earth Defense Alliance by gathering the power of all nations to fight this foreign threat. And since Edward was the most powerful wizard around, and the leader of the magical world, he was nominated as the prescient of the Alliance. His first order was not to bury the people who had their souls sucked away, he promised all the people of Earth to find a way to save them. Of course, many members of the Alliance disagreed with this, saying that it was too costly to keep the body of these people alive and that there was no evidence to even suggest that they were still alive. Nevertheless, Edward insisted an act which greatly increased the general people's empathy and support of him as the leader. In two years, the Alliance fought an all-out war with the Dementors. Unfortunately, the number of wizards capable of fighting these creatures was very small, so the loss was very high. More than 100 million people had their souls sucked out of their bodies, turning into a vegetative state. Luckily, in the year 2000, a new invention turned the war around. A new mage tech gun that was enchanted with a spell that could kill Dementors was finally created, and it was possible to mass-produce. So, the war finally turned around in just a few months. Finally, the leader of the Earth Defense Alliance, Edward Bones, located the Dementor King which was the leader of this invasion. He fought a legendary that was watched by all the people of this planet. This battle would be recorded as the Battle of Gods by history due to how powerful these two individuals were. After defeating the Dementor King, the hero of the Alliance, Edward Bones managed to recapture all the souls that the Dementors sucked away, and placed them back to their owner's body, thus saving more than 100 million people. However, soon a piece of terrible news soon quickly spread throughout the world. The hero of Earth, the leader of the Alliance was stepping down from his role and giving up his power since according to him, the Alliance was only temporary. Many people became fearful after hearing this and started to protest. The recent events proved to the people of Earth that they were not alone in the universe. Thus, they needed to unite to face threats from the cosmos. More importantly, they needed a strong and charismatic leader to guide them in these unprecedented times. Although it was honorable for the Alliance leader to give up all his power, this was not what the people wanted. So, after three months of people rioting and protesting all over the world, Edward finally answered their call. He established the Arcane Empire, and he became the Arcane Emperor. However, in order not to let power corrupt him, he established the Ten Rings Council to govern in his place. The council is made up of nine members that are voted by the people, while the elder of the council was elected by Edward himself. Although the Arcane Emperor has absolute power in the empire, he will not easily intervene in politics. Just like that, 35 years passed by since the inception of the Arcane Empire. Chapter 115 Arcane Empire I Inside a space station, Harry stood next to Ginny and Ron, who was holding hand with Lavender Brown. He looked at his son and said, Albus, is everything ready? Yes, father. We can leave now. Why do we have to take the space elevator? Wouldn't it be better to just use the warp portal to instantly travel from Mars to Earth, complained the youngest daughter, who was named Lisa Lily Potter. Since it is a family vacation, then we have to enjoy ourselves as much as possible, replied Ginny. Meanwhile, Ron was also talking to his only son. Do you have everything prepared for school? Yes, father. That's good. After that, the two families entered a private room. They sat down, strapped themselves down. When it was time, the room started to descend like an elevator. Immediately, all of them looked to the glass windows, looking at Earth from outer space. The blue planet looked vivid and alive. Every time I see this sight, I'm still fascinated, said Lavender. Me too. I never imagined in my lifetime that I would ever get to experience such a magical sight, replied Ginny. Both Harry and Ron felt similar sentiments, unfortunately, their children were looking at them weirdly. Harry noticed his children's gaze, but he just secretly shook his head. These kids were born after the establishment of the Arcane Empire, so they were not aware of the old days. To them, that period is nothing but history. Three hours later, the elevator arrived on Earth. To be precise, it was in Brazil, which was the location of the elevator. After that, they went straight into a special room. Inside the room was a massive door frame with a circular platform in front of it. As soon as they entered, they were received by a female attendant. Welcome customer to the warp portal. Can you please tell me your destination, said the attendant. Bones Advanced School of Magic, said Harry Potter. Oh, the famous Academy City. Unfortunately, without a sufficient level of authority or a permit, you cannot directly teleport there. Harry raised his hand to show his watch. A holographic image appeared in front of the attendant. Name, Harry Potter. Level of clearance, 3C. Such a high level of clearance, thought the attendant. And why does the name Potter sound familiar? The attendant took out a device to scan Harry's watch, then she said. Sir, according to your level of clearance, you and your family can indeed teleport to your destination. Then, she looked at Ron who also showed her his watch. Unfortunately, sir, you only have level 2B clearance and cannot directly teleport there. Check your record, said Ron. My son is attending the school, so I should have a permit to enter. The attendant hurriedly checked before saying, my apologies for the error. Now, do you guys want to pay with arcane points or arcane coins? Arcane coins, replied Harry without hesitation. 
Arcane Point was the new name for Reward Point and is a very valuable resource. Meanwhile, Arcane Coins are merely the new currency of the Empire. In just a few seconds, the two made an online transaction and paid for the services. Then, all of them stood on the circular platform. A white veil appeared on the door frame, acting as the door. I still cannot believe how expensive these things actually are, said Lavender. It's not like our family cannot afford them, replied Ron. Your Weasley family might be wealthy, but it does not mean that mine is, added Lavender Brown as she glared at him. Although Ron wanted to say that you're now a Weasley, he quickly shut his mouth after seeing the look Harry gave him. After charging for a few seconds, the white light from the gate enveloped them, forcing them to close their eyes. Once the group opened it again, they found themselves in a different location. There was still a large gate behind them, but the surroundings were different. A male attendant waited in front of them and said, Welcome to Bones Academic City. After politely saluting the attendant, the family left the location of the warp portal, and they soon found themselves in a busy city. People of different colors and races walked together, dressed in strange clothes. The majority of them had magic robes found in fantasies with a hood on the back. While other people dressed in clothes that were a combination of Middle Ages and modern style. And that included the Potters and Weasley. In the past few decades, the fashion trend of the empire has greatly changed to look more similar to a fantasy world. The kids looked at everything around them with awe, they looked at the sky-high buildings, the flying cars, and the golem operating the traffic lights, and cleaning up the trash. Look, it's the magic towers, said Albus with excitement as he pointed to a group of towers that were as tall as any skyscraper. Powerful mana could feel from them even from a few miles away. Which one is grandma's, asked. It's the sixth tower, responded Harry as he pointed to it. Albus, Lisa, and James were quite excited after seeing it. In the Empire, only a few wizards are worthy to have their own tower. And each one is not only powerful but has contributed greatly to the development of the Empire. So, it is the highest of honor for any wizard to be granted their own magic tower. Meanwhile, Ron's son Hugo looked up at his father with questioning eyes. So, Ron pointed to a building. Your grandfather is a mage tech engineer, so he has his own research building. However, your uncles George and Fred are the owner of the Ninth Tower. Hugo nodded with a smile. Since childhood, he has always adored his grandfather and uncles. Is it true that Uncle George and Fred will soon get the title of, Alchemist? Don't listen to their bragging, responded Ron. Currently in the Empire, alchemy is divided into three fields, potions, magic crafter, or artificer, and mage tech engineer. If anyone wants the title of alchemist, they have to have accomplishments in at least two of these fields. Although your uncle's talent for magic crafting is truly amazing, the same cannot be said for the other two fields, O. Oh, oh. Hugo nodded his head, but his worship for his uncles did not diminish because of this fact. Soon, after that, the two families went on a tour of the entire city. The city had an academic air surrounding them. Everyone, you can see scholars, scientists, engineers, and wizards of different fields. This city deserves the title of the academic center of the world, commented Ginny. Well, more than 95% of the empire's magical and technological development came from this city, so it is normal. What I'm more curious about is how this man-made island was created for the site of the city, said Lavender. According to my father, the arcane emperor designed the blueprint himself, and my father helped build it along with many other mage tech engineers, replied Ron. It's still a surprise to me. How is that a surprise, added Hugo. The empire has colonized most of the solar system, and you think a small man-made island is something amazing. Ron tapped the back of his son's head, have some respect on how you speak boy. Father, I'm 17 years old now, you can't just beat me whenever you feel like it. As long as you are my son, I can still beat you. Although Hugo was upset, he did not say anything. His father was a wizard knight, and those people were barbarians. After spending a few hours touring the city, the family headed to the location of the Bones Advanced School of Magic and Witchcraft. Underscore 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 underscore. Chapter 116 Arcane Empire, 2. Since Hugo and Albus were best friends since young, they decided to share the same dormitory just like they did at Hogwarts. So, after registering, the family took the kids into their dormitory. Inside Albus's room, Harry gave his son a private lecture. Abus, I'm sure you are wondering why I insisted on you becoming a magic researcher instead of following in my footstep and becoming a battle mage. Albus nodded his head. That's because of your grandfather, James. Throughout the years, our family has been trying to raise enough arcane points to resurrect him. Unfortunately, the amount required is truly enormous. Albus frowned after hearing this, then he asked, then, how did all those people in the news manage to gather enough points? Harry looked at his wife after hearing this question, after she nodded his head, he explained, well, I will tell you a little secret. None of these people have gathered enough arcane points to resurrect someone. The reason that they were granted such an opportunity was that the Empire wanted to show the world that it had this ability, so a few people were chosen at random and displayed to the world. Of course, this was a way to raise the prestige of the arcane emperor and solidify his control over the Empire, 
but that is not something that he should know for now, secretly thought Harry. So, that's how it is. But, couldn't I still get plenty of arcane points as a battle mage? Harry sighed deeply, the sad truth is battle mages are considered thugs by most scholar mages because we only learn how to use magic and never contributed to its creation and innovation. And with the arcane emperor greatly encouraging innovation and deep study of magic, scholar mages have a higher status than battle mages, and it is easier for them to acquire arcane points for their research, development, or discovery. The only way for a battle mage to quickly gather arcane point is to invent new spells, but as I said, all of us are trained to use magic and skills to the highest level, but not innovate. How is that fair, said Albus. The majority of battle mages will easily defeat a scholar mage in a magic duel. Harry looked at his son thinking about how young and ignorant he was. Although his statement may be true for some low-level scholar mages, the truly powerful ones are really scary. Because of how deep their understanding of magic is, these scholar mages are the real powerhouse of the empire. Furthermore, these scholar mages will also study dueling techniques of battle mages to improve their strength. Patting his son in the head, Harry said. There is no need to worry about anything else, just focus on your study so that you can graduate with the utmost honor. Then, with your grandmother's influence, you can choose any of the towers to intern with. Hopefully, one day, you will also become a tower master. After setting his son in, Harry left with his wife. I don't think we should have placed so much pressure on him, said Ginny.rwo.co. I know, but we do not have much of a choice. After saying that, Harry started thinking about a conversation he had with his mother not too long ago. Scene break. Harry was having diner with his mother Lily, who has not aged a single bit in the past 35 years. Is there something wrong? You looked more weary than usual, asked Harry. My recent experiment failed. Despite all my effort, no one besides me has ever managed to wield love magic in the past few decades. Is the empire going to reduce your fundings, asked Harry. Not really. As matter of fact, as long I'm the only one capable of wielding that magic, I am invaluable to the arcane emperor. So, why are you in such a rush to have another person wield love magic, asked Harry with a frown. Lily paused for a moment, took her glass of wine, and drank a sip. I guess there is no point in hiding this from you now. I strongly believe that the arcane emperor is suppressing the number of arcane points that I can receive for my accomplishments. Recently, he had been using the fact that no one else could use love magic to dismiss or diminish my results. Why would he do that? From what I know, he is usually very generous especially to the tower masters. Lily swirled the wine in her glass, then she answered, if I were to guess, it should have something to do with Severus. Uncle Snape? What does he have to do with anything? However, Lily did not respond this time. Harry thought quickly before saying, Are you saying that the Arcane Emperor is intentionally delaying you to revive my father to provide Uncle Snape a chance to get with you? Although this sounds absurd, Harry knew of Snape's love for his mother. In the past decades, he has been very present in their lives, spending a great deal of time with them. Why would he do that? asked Harry, bewildered. Snape is one of the most powerful and influential tower master of the Empire. He has made so many accomplishments in the potion field over the past decades, adding to the fact that he is one of the earlier supporters of the Arcane Emperor, it's normal for him to be favored. Did you talk to him? I did confront him, and he admitted himself, replied before taking another big sip of her wine. So, what are you going to do? asked Harry. As an adult, he can look at things differently. He could tell that over the years, his mother had developed some form of affection for Snape. However, because of him and her devotion as a wife, she wanted to reunite their family. Scene break. Back to the present, Harry regained his bearing as he walked out of the dormitory. However, he noticed that his other son, James was unusually quiet. James, is there something wrong? No, I'm just wondering whether I can be admitted to the Bones Advanced School of Magic and Witchcraft. The family suddenly became quiet, until Lisa Potter said, with your grades and talent, keep dreaming. Ginny quickly reprimanded her daughter, then said to his son, don't listen to your sister. Grades and magical talent are not the only factors that determine whether you get in. Look at your Uncle Ron, he only got onto the military strategy division because of his talent for wizard chest. Later on, he was discovered to have the talent to be a wizard knight. After you graduate from Hogwarts, we will pay for a potential test for you to see whether you have any hidden talent that can get you into the school. And if all else fails, your grandmother can still use her connection to get you in. James nodded his head, but he was not happy. He knew how people who got into this school through connection are treated. Harry patted him on the shoulder and said, There are many other magic universities you can still attend. Just because you do not get into this one does not mean you cannot be successful in life. Chapter 117 Arcane Empire 3 In another dorm, Draco Malfoy was speaking to his son, Scorpius. I know the people of the dark magic division in the school are strange, so be careful not to have an accident. Scorpius nodded his head without saying anything. Noting the distraction of his son, Draco said, There is no need to worry. The stigma and infamy surrounding dark magic have long been removed by the Empire. It's not that. I'm just wondering why both grandfather and you insisted on me becoming a battle mage. 
wouldn't be better to become a scholar mage and even one day own a tower like grandma? Malfoy paused for a moment before asking, tell me what you know of our family? In terms of status and power, how are we in the empire? Of course, we are one of the most powerful families in the empire, replied Scorpius. As one of the earliest followers of the arcane emperor, grandfather is the commander-in-chief of the earth defense army. Basically, he controlled the entire army of the empire. So, our family is very powerful. This is where the problem lies. What do you mean? Do you know the aura department? Yes. They are basically the police force of this planet. Anything a crime occurs both magical and non-magical they are in charge of capturing the individual, replied Scorpius in confusion. Ten years ago, the aura department was under your grandpa's jurisdiction. However, the council voted to separate them and the arcane emperor agreed. Five years ago, the space marine was also under your grandfather's jurisdiction, but now, they are a separate division of their own. Do you see where I'm going with this? Are you saying that grandfather's power is slowly being divided? That's correct. Recently, there are even been rumors that the Earth Defense Army will also be further divided. Why? Our family has always been loyal to the arcane emperor. That may be true, but it does not change the fact that we held too much power. Adding to that the fact that my father has proven incapable of actually controlling such large forces, it is only natural for our power to reduce. Scorpius was silent for a moment, then he asked, is there anything that we can do to prevent it from happening? No, but we can take measures to ensure that our family still retains some power. For example, I have been slowly climbing the ranks in the Royal Guard, and hopefully, I can one day become its commander. Scorpius knew about the Royal Guard which was an elite army that reported only to the Arcane Emperor, only he has the power to dispatch them. According to rumors, under the same conditions and with the same equipment, the Royal Guard can defeat both the Earth Defense Army and the Space Marine at the same time. Adding to the fact that they are privy to the best and newest equipment and resources, they are truly the elite of the Empire. As for you, continued Malfoy, your grandfather and I want you to enter the Ghost Squad. Ghost Squad? I've never heard of them. That's the point. Only a few people know of their existence, while the others are dead once they do. If the Royal Guard is the right arm and positive light of the Emperor, then the Ghost Squad is the left and dark side, the shadow. Scorpius was shocked by this sudden news, then he became scared thinking whether someone will kill him for knowing such information. Do you remember the rumors about the Royal Guard? asked Malfoy who was unaware of his son's internal turmoil. Scorpius nodded his head. Well, they are not true. The Royal Guard can beat any of the other armies individually, but not at the same time. However, the Ghost Squad is different, they are simply unstoppable. What makes them so strong? Every member of this squad signed a contract giving his soul to the Arcane Emperor. In return, they are personally trained by him and with all the resources of the Empire. An example, even the Tower Masters need Arcane points to exchange certain knowledge, potions, or ceremonies from the Arcane Grand Library. It is the law that all the people of the Empire have to follow except for the members of the Ghost Squad. Anything they want or desire, they will be given to strengthening themselves. Malfoy patted his son's shoulder and said, according to the potential test, you have a very high talent for dark magic. Develop that talent to the best of your ability, and after you graduate, your grandfather can ask the Arcane Emperor to give you a spot in the Ghost Squad. Scorpius nodded his head in acknowledgement before muttering, anyway, our family will still be more powerful than the Potters. Don't underestimate the Potters, said Malfoy. Lily Potter is one of the few individuals not a member of the royal family or directly served the Arcane Emperor to gain level 4 access, that's how important she is considered by the Arcane Emperor. After having this chat with his son, Malfoy left. Scene break. Albus said goodbye to his parents, then he returned to his room. He saw Hugo who was excited at the prospect of not having his father around all the time. What are you going to do now? asked Albus. I'm going to play some games. What about you? Study. Don't be such a nerd. Come play with me. However, Albus ignored him and entered his room and closed the door behind. To be exact, he entered his section of the dorm. His so-called room or section was very large as an extended charm was placed on it. Inside, there was three room, one bedroom, one study room, and a bathroom. Albus entered the study room and immediately took notice of the sleeping chamber inside. Without hesitation, he opened the lid up, laid inside, and closed it. Scanning facial recognition. Scanning soul imprint. Detecting mana. Scanning mana signature. Welcome to Skynet, Sir Albus Potter. Reminder, your security level is 1A. Do you want to use Neural Link or Soul Link, NL.C? Soul Link. Warning, although Soul Link has a 100% realness compared to Neural Link's 90% of realness, there is still some potential danger that comes from it. Do you still wish to continue? Yes. Very well. According to your soul strength, you can only stay connected for approximately 2 h 39 minutes 23 seconds. Activate the soul soothing potion in the pod, ordered Albus. As you command. Activating. Your current time is now exactly 5 hours. Soon afterward, Albus found himself in a white empty room, and his appearance was that of his virtual avatar. 
He waved his hand and a holographic image of different icons showed in front of him. There was one for the internet, social media, game, etc. Albus quickly picked the app for the Bones School and registered. Immediately, a list of online classes he could take appeared in front of him. These classes contained lectures from different professors, tower masters, and even the arcane emperor himself. Since Albus was interested in illusion magic, he chose lessons in those categories. Soon, Albus spent weeks studying illusion magic. From theory to practice, to application, he learned many things. However, once the five hours arrived, he was kicked out from the soul link. So, he opened the pod to go take a shower since he knew he could not link again until the next day. While taking a shower, Albus was thinking about all the things he just learned. Although only five hours passed in the real world, he spent weeks learning in the virtual world because of perception time dilation magic. So, he had a lot to review. Once he finished, he went to bed. Tomorrow was the first day of class, so he wanted to get some rest. Chapter 118 Arcane Empire 4 After Harry sent his son Albus to school, he used the warp portal to return home. Hogwarts will start in a few days, so James and Lisa were still on vacation. Do you have Quidditch practice today? asked Harry. Yes. The club just invited a new talented player, responded Ginny. Hopefully, we can finally win the Euro Championship this year, and even the Arcane Cup. Harry nodded his head, is this new player a wizard? No, but does that matter? No, I was just curious. Instead of being curious, how about you quit your job as an Auror and join our team? I still remember how you lead Hogwarts to win the Global Magic School Quidditch competition and even the International Youth Quidditch Cup. Those were the good old days, muttered Harry. However, you know that I never truly wanted to play Quidditch professionally, FVL.O. Ginny nodded her head but no longer insisted. After a brief chat with his wife, Harry left for work. He went to his backyard, entered his private jet which looked eerily similar to the one the Shield Quinjet except for the glowing runes that shone on it. After entering the jet, Harry activated the automated driving system and entered his destination. A few minutes later, after traveling at a few mock speed, he arrived at a tall building in Germany. The building had the words, Aura Department, Europe Division. Since there was a specific parking spot for private jets, Harry parked it on his private spot. Then, he walked to work. He used his watch to scan for his identity and level of security, then he headed to his office. However, as soon as he entered the building, countless voices assaulted his senses. People were chatting over one another, with their voices overlapping, everyone looked excited. With a frown on his face, Harry approached one of the Aurors and tapped her on the shoulder, what's going on? Why is everyone so excited today? Vice Director, you're here. You can forfeit the formal greetings. Tell me what's going on? Well, Johnson has just finished his second genetic enhancement, so he is currently challenging Captain Barrack. Johnson should be smarter than this. Captain Barrack is a wizard that has broken the first limiter and survived the first dragon magic vein operation, his chances are slim, replied Harry. According to him, he has been secretly training with his brother, who is a space marine. Harry nodded his head, although many people often complained that the space marines have nothing to do, their training is truly intense and only the elite can finish it. After that, he headed to the dueling area. He saw two people standing opposite of another. One of them was wearing a wizard robe with a hood, holding a long staff. Meanwhile, the other participant had an all-black combat uniform, a sword in his hand, and a gun in his waist. As soon as Harry arrived, many people stood up to salute him, but he just motioned them to continue doing their own thing. After taking a seat in the private booth, he started watching the fight. As soon as the battle commenced, Johnson rushed towards his opponent with his sword. His speed was so fast that he would make Usain Bolt look like a child racing against an Olympian champion. In less than a second, he traveled more than 20 meters distance, reaching in front of Barrack, who remained calm throughout the entire process. However, when he was about to be slashed by the sword, his staff light up green, and plant roots appeared from the ground trying to entangle Johnson. The latter tried to cut off these roots, unfortunately, they grew quicker than he could cut them. After a few seconds of non-stop hacking, Johnson realized that his opponent was slowly exhausting his stamina, so he changed strategy. He concentrated on the sword in his hand, then, the blue crystal at the hill suddenly lit up, and a red flame appeared on it. With a swing of his sword, a small flame tornado rushed to the roots, burning them. However, before Johnson could celebrate his victory, a light flew from Barrack's wand rushing towards him. His instinct kicked in, and he rolled on the ground to evade. Expelarimus charm? Is he trying to disarm me of my mage tech sword? Johnson still did not have the time to react as the ground started to shake, and before long, spikes grew from the ground trying to impale him. Earth magic? No, it should be transfiguration. He jumped more than meters in the air, do a backflip, and landed a few meters away. Nevertheless, the spike still grew from the ground. Suddenly, Johnson's boots light up, and runes appeared on them. Then, his speed drastically increased. Leaving shadows behind, he easily managed to evade the earth spikes. He then took out the gun from his waist and fired at Barrack, who instantly used a shield to block the attack. Then, the wizard used the spell Projectile Misdirection. 
After seeing his bullets missed, Johnson pressed a button on the gun, then it suddenly morphed into a slightly bigger gun with writing or runes appearing on it. Bang! The bullet traveled very fast and pierced Barrack's shield instantly. However, before hitting him, the ring in his finger lit up, and another shield appeared to block it. Johnson, you're playing dirty by using enchanted bullets, said Barrack for the first time since the battle began. This is part of my equipment, just like your alchemy items, replied Johnson nonchalantly. True. I have to say, you have improved tremendously to be able to last so long against me. However, if this is all you've got, you're bound to lose. Don't worry, I still got some things up my sleeve. After that, Johnson held the sword with two hands as he concentrated on it, his memories flash back to his training with his brother. What do you know about mage tech equipment? asked Terry, who was a muscular man with a military haircut. Mage tech equipment are essentially magic artifacts but imbued with mana crystals on them to serve as activation energy. As such, ordinary people can use them. Anything else? Th that should be it. Well, you would be wrong. What you describe are only civilian mage tech items. When it comes to military grades 1, there is more to them. What do you mean? All military grade mage tech artifacts have a specific enchantment on them called will wielding enchantment. What it does is that it allows ordinary users to control the amount of mana that is released through the mana crystals, based on the user's will. So, the stronger the will of the user, the more mana he can release from the mana crystal, thus the more power he can bring out from the equipment. Johnson frowned after hearing this, I don't quite understand what you mean. In that case, let me show you. Terry took out a sword and a flame appeared on it after he activated it, the flame was red and only enveloped the blade of the sword. However, a few seconds later, to the horror of Johnson, the flame slowly turned blue and rose to more than two meters into the sky. Whether it is the Earth Defense Force, the Royal Guard, or the Space Marine, we are trained to hone our wills so that we can better control mage tech artifacts. Why doesn't our aura department know of this? The people that should know already do, replied Terry calmly. After hearing this, Johnson nodded his head with a sigh. Back to the present. After concentrating on the sword for a few seconds, the flame on it turned blue, and it rose a few inches into the air. Johnson swing it, and a massive blue tornado rushed towards Barrack who was greatly surprised. However, his instinct overcame his body and used an ice shield spell, encasing his body in ice to block the attack. A massive explosion occurred as the dueling ground shook like an earthquake. Luckily, the entire ground was magically enchanted, so there was not that much damage. After the smoke of the explosion cleared, Barrack was intact, but Johnson was breathing heavily. He looked drained. I lost, he muttered. You should be proud to force a wizard to such a degree, replied Barrack. However, Johnson just lowered his head and left the dueling grounds. He knew that this match was not as close as Barrack made it out to be. For example, never once was his opponent use apparition, and he only used one magic artifact. Nowadays, most wizards carry a bunch of magical artifacts around them to make up for their deficiency and planned for unexpected outcomes. No to mention the fact that mage tech requires people to constantly recharge the mana crystal embedded in them. And after using it for a certain amount of time, the crystal will be destroyed and a new one has to be bought. After the duel ended, many people were talking about it out loud. It's really difficult for ordinary people to beat wizards even after being genetically enhanced. Well, that's normal. After all, they can also genetically enhance themselves. They can even enhance their bloodlines, something that we cannot do. Oh, I wish I was a wizard. Using magic through mage tech and wielding on your own is not the same thing at all. Don't say such a stupid thing. How do you know what it feels like to wield real magic? I'll have you know, my father has a high-level security clearance, and he allowed me to soul link to Skynet. There I play the game, Hogwarts, School of Magic and Adventure. With 100% realness, I know how it's like to be a real wizard and wield magic. Unfortunately, my soul strength only allows me to play for 24 minutes a day. Why didn't you buy soul-soothing potions? Those things are too expensive. Forget about that. How was the experience of being a wizard? Hey, you over there. Instead of answering this guy's question, you should be more worried about yourself. Doesn't your father know that it's a grave crime to allow someone else to use your security clearance, e.cm? Of course, I know that. So, we went through the proper method. In that case, that's fine. While everyone was still talking about the recent fight, Harry headed to his boss's office as he just received a summon. Sue, he reached an office with a door plaque labeled Kingsley Shacklebolt, or Director General. Chapter 119, Ten Rings Council, I. After entering the director's room, Harry saw an old man with white hair waiting for him. He closed the door behind him before saying, Sir, you called me? Yes. How was the fight? Johnson still lost, but he put up a better fight than usual. Kingsley nodded his head before changing the topic, I've called you for two things. The first thing is about the selection for the next director general. I've chosen you as my replacement, feeol.c. But, sir, your term is still a long way from being over. Kingsley sighed, I'm approaching my 90s now, so my energy is not the same anymore. Sir, with genetic engineering, every ordinary citizen of the empire can live up to 200 years old now. 
Plus, there is still the elixir of immortality. There is no need to hurry to retire. Aging and death is a natural process of life, Harry, said Kingsley. I have accepted that fact, so I have no desire for long life. Harry sighed but did not continue to persuade. In that case, why don't you choose Moody as your replacement? He is more deserving of it than me. In fact, all the other five vice directors deserve it more than me. I've talked to Alastair, and he has no interest in becoming director and being stuck behind a desk. You know him as much as I do. All he cares about is catching dark wizards and criminals. As for the other vice directors, the reason that I did not choose them is that they do not have your talents or your connection. My job requires someone who is not afraid of pointing his wand at the powerful and wealthy figures of the empire. A person who can execute the law no matter who breaks it. Harry was silent for a moment as he realized that his mother was one of the reasons that he was chosen for this position. After all, no one would dare to use their power and influence to threaten a family member of a tower master. As such, Harry can do his job without worrying about politics and corruption amongst the Auror. At least, not in his department. I accept the position, sir. What's the second thing you wanted to see me about? Kingsley nodded in satisfaction after hearing this, then he took a case file to hand over to Harry, who secretly shook his head at his director's old-fashioned methods. He quickly read through it. A case of people suspected of doing illegal experiments in Italy? Can't the local official do anything about it? If they could, they would not send the case to us. That's true. He then sighed out loud. I never understood why these people will commit such atrocities. Harry looked at the pictures of mutilated bodies that were dissected. There was all kind of different races like human, vampires, etc. It's quite easy to understand their motives. We live in a time where knowledge equates to power, fame, money, immortality, and eternal youth. Of course, some people will go to extreme length to acquire these things, replied Kingsley calmly. All they had to do was ask the Empire permission to set up their labs, and many of these innocent lives could be saved. The Empire does countless experiments every day, are we any different than those criminals? The difference is that only clones are used, rebutted Harry. Officially, but is it really? Plus, aren't clones also people? Don't they have their own souls and will? Harry was silent as he knew his boss was correct, but he also knew that he was also part of a group of people that believe that the Empire's rapid rise of technology through inhumane experimentation should be stopped. These people are dedicated to stopping this. However, Harry also learned from his mother that the Arcane Emperor is aware of these people's existence, and allowed them to exist to give people the illusion that things like freedom of speech still exist. The sad truth is that the Arcane Emperor has total and absolute control of the Empire, and no one can shake that control. Taking a moment to regain his thoughts, Harry said. What about the Diviners? If we had some of them helping, unless these criminals have anti-divination magic, this case will be solved quickly. You know how stuck up these Diviners are. While waiting for the proper paper to be filed and receiving help from them, more people might disappear, or the clues in the case might be cleaned up, replied Kingsley with an unpleasant tone. Plus, the majority of diviners are busy recently helping the council with something. Harry nodded his head before saying, in that case, I will take a few people with me to the site and investigate. Scene break. North Atlantic Ocean, a man-made island was floating in the air. On it was a vast building designed with different architecture designs from different cultures. Despite being mashed up with so many different architectural designs, it looked extremely beautiful. Inside the building, a large number of people were sitting and talking to one another. In this room, there was human, wizards, werewolves, vampires, centaurs, and even a mermaid encased in a water bubble. All intelligent races were represented in this meeting, and people of different races and ethnicities. After everybody arrived, a bell ringed inside the meeting room, making everybody quiet. Soon, ten people dressed in elegant robes with Uroboros making a ring on them appeared and sat on the elevated seats. Among these people was Amelia Bones, who sat in the seat in the middle. Her robe was blue instead of red like the others, and her Uroboros symbol had a crown on top. She was the last of the ten people to arrive, and as soon as she entered the room, everyone stood up and saluted her, Welcome, the Honorable Great Elder. Amelia nodded her head then motioned for everyone to sit down. Let's begin today's meeting. Chapter 120, Ten Rings Council, 2. What's on the agenda first for today? asked Amelia. One person stood up and said, The first issue is regarding poaching. In the past year, the number of magical animals captured and secretly sold on the black market has dramatically increased. Is it the Animaniacs group responsible for this? asked one of the Ten Rings sitting next to Amelia. No, we destroyed their main group in Saturn a few years ago, this is a new group, responded the person who brought the issue. How serious is the current problem? asked another Ten Ring member. Very serious, responded one of the centaurs in the room, who was wearing a tuxedo on his upper body. Many members of our race have gone missing in the past few months. We would like to catch whoever is responsible for this, and if possible, bring their bodies back for a proper burial. The mermaid in the room who was actually quite beautiful due to bloodline atavism suddenly started to sing, then her voice was translated for everybody to hear. The same can be said for members of our clan. Many people secretly looked at her. 
Some lust after her beauty, while some people did not like her because she could speak in human tongues, but refused to do so. After those two races talked, many people came forward to talk about the disappearance of these magical races. Order, said Amelia, her voice echoed loudly like a speaker in the room. Everyone then quiets down. Did the diviners not track these people? No, Council Elder. They seem to be very proficient in anti-divination magic. In that case, I propose we use the sorcerers I designed by your highness, Seer Luna Lovegood to scan the entire solar system. Wouldn't that be wasting too many resources, asked one of the Ten Rings counselors sitting next to Amelia. Do you think that resources are more important than keeping the interspecies relationship of the Empire, asked another Ten Rings member while glaring at the previous guy. You know that's what I meant. How do I know what you mean? Enough with you two's bickering, said Amelia. Notified the relevant department to use the sorcerer's eye to find these traffickers. Everyone nodded as they knew that the situation would be quickly resolved with this method. The sorcerer eye is basically a satellite with many other magical enchantments. For example, it had the ability of the Marauder's Map, thus the location of everybody in the Empire could be located when needed. Additionally, it was personally enchanted with a powerful divination spell personally placed by Luna herself. And unless someone was a better prophet than her, no one can escape her sight. And she is currently the most powerful prophet of the Empire, with Albion recognizing that she had a noble seer bloodline hidden inside of her. After founding this out, for the first time, Edward found a person that Albion did look down upon including him. According to the Dragon King, seers are the most respectable bloodlines in the universe, and even dragons have to respect them. What's next on the agenda? asked Amelia. The movement to oppose clone experiments has drastically increased in the past few months. Large gatherings and protests have occurred not only on Earth, but on the other colonies as well. Here we go again. Last year, we listened to these people and banned experiments on death row prisoners, but now, they even want to place their claws on clones? Don't they know one of the reasons for the rapid development of genetic technology and many other fields is because we can experiment on clones? Let's not complain, but deal with the situation. I propose we use force to deal with these protests. It's about time we showed them that the empire is a monarchy, not a democracy. This would only be a temporary solution, replied Amelia. We need something permanent, or long-term. We can order the large media to stop covering these protests, control the information on Skynet. Additionally, we can ruin the reputation of the leaders of these protests, thus decreasing the number of supporters. That's indeed a good method. Just like that, the decision was made. The next step on our list is regarding religion. What's the issue this time? The person who spoke this time hesitated for a moment, then she said, well, the rise of the arcane god religion has dramatically increased. According to the law, no one can worship the arcane emperor as a god, but many people have done so. And with how much the religion has gained ground, there is a high chance that they are supported by powerful people including members of the council. The room instantly became quiet as everyone looked at one another. After a few minutes of awkward silence, one of the Ten Rings looked at Amelia and said, Council Elder, I don't think worshipping the emperor as a god is necessarily a bad thing. It could help weaken the other religions still existing and increase the cohesive strength of the empire in general. After all, faith can be a very powerful weapon for control. I understand your point as I already mentioned this to him, but Edward is very adamant regarding this issue, replied Amelia. Could we at least know why? Amelia nodded, then with a wave of her hand, a large holographic screen appeared in front of everybody. With people worshipping him, the emperor has already noticed a new energy or power created by faith. However, according to a preliminary study of it, it is very corrosive to the mind and soul. Re. C. So, until it is further studied and understood, he does not want to use it. In that case, wouldn't it be better to just let those people so that we can gather more faith to study? There is no need to support them, but we do not need to prevent them as well. That's indeed a good idea, replied Amelia. However, their growth should be controlled as well. All these politically savvy people knew that these words were a warning to those people secretly supporting the religion. What's next? This time, it is concerning the death cult. A new leader might have been chosen. So soon? We only killed the last one three months ago. Although not entirely sure, the recent activities of the cult would suggest so. All the council members begin to whisper to one another, thinking of a possible solution to this problem. One young man stood up and said with passion in his voice, Since the empire allows freedom of religion, why not grant the same privilege to the death cult? After all, our previous actions have proven that suppression is not the ideal method. As soon as he said these words, many people looked at him in shock, thinking this guy was crazy. Then, they realized that he was a newbie that was recently elected to the council. One of the Ten Rings council members who was the one who endorsed this kid in his election quickly took out his smartwatch, downloaded a document, and sent it to him. The newbie knowing that he did something wrong, quickly read over the file sent to him. Instantly, cold sweat started to drip from his back. Not only because he just learned of the afterlife, but because he knew the existence of the Empire's current greatest enemy, the death god, Herpo the Fowl. And according to this file, this powerful god is secretly influencing the death cult to do his bidding which is currently unknown. 
So, the Empire will destroy any person related to the death cult in any shape or form.